In the immediate aftermath of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, the American government came to the conclusion that a lone gunman had changed the course of human history by killing the most powerful man in the world with three rifle shots fired from the elevated window of an office building. And for half a century, they have stuck rigidly to this fabrication, while critics, scientists, playwrights and poets have produced books and essays and films to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that this version of our Western history is a physical impossibility. Over and over again, we have been told that this man did it, by himself. He didn't have any help, and he did it because he was a lonely madman and a communist to boot. We are also meant to believe that there is nothing remotely suspicious in his being shot on live television in a basement full of police officers before he had a chance to tell his side of the story. So there is quite clearly no need to investigate further. Of course, every thinking person knows this is absolute nonsense. And being nonsensical, it naturally leads thinking people to ask some very important questions, like, why did the American government come up with such a lame and improbable scenario to account for what had happened? And then why did they stick with it so dogmatically for so many years afterwards? Exactly what and who are they protecting? And how can it be that even such venerable institutions as the BBC have played along with this charade in the intervening decades? We now know that there were actually eight riflemen firing at the president on that day. We know where they were located in Dealey Plaza and we know their names. However, those with sharp eyes will already be asking themselves why we were only showing the location of six assassins in this schematic. We're doing this because any casual onlooker who happened to be in Daly Plaza at 12.29 on November 22, 1963, might well have caught sight of these six. Many people did. Witnesses like Arnold Rowland, Richard Randolph Carr, Lee Bowers, Amos Ewans, Mary Mormon, they all gave precise descriptions of men they observed in the windows of the book depository and on the famous grassy knoll. But none of them observed two of the riflemen who shot at the president. No one did. And the reason why no one did is itself the key to the mystery. A mystery which begins with a very simple question. Supposing you wanted to shoot at a man on a barren, empty street without anybody seeing you, where could you possibly hide? However, the riflemen who took part in the assassination were not as important to an understanding of what the Kennedy assassination was really all about as were a group of 20 men who had gathered together the night before at the home of Dallas oil millionaire Clint Murchison. These men were a much more important part of the story than the assassins themselves because they hired the eight snipers and paid them. We even know how much they paid them. So who were these men? What brought them together to orchestrate such a foul and despicable deed? Why did they, and more importantly those who came after them, cover up the crime with such ruthless brutality for so long afterwards? And how can it be that these men and what they stood for has left an indelible legacy which still influences our daily lives right up to the present day? To answer these questions, we must inevitably step back into history. And most people will not like this very much because most people have very little interest in history. This, however, is going to be a history lesson quite unlike anything that anyone has ever heard. It certainly will be nothing like what we are taught in school. And yet it begins with a name which most people have heard but probably won't be able to place. The name of E.H. Harriman. Who was E.H. Harriman? Dynamite's ready, Butch. Mr. E.H. Harriman himself, he has a confidential... Of... Open the door or that's it! You think E.H. Harriman would get himself killed for you, Woodcock? I work for Mr. E.H. Harriman on the Union Pacific Railroad. And he entrusted me... 
I'm sure Americans in particular will be amused to learn that Edward Henry Harriman was actually a real historical figure. This man was one of America's first industrial giants, and like the Rockefellers in oil and the Carnegies in steel, he got his start by borrowing money from the Rothschilds, of whom we'll hear more later, to create a monopoly for his own business, which was railroads. He was the 19th century railroad king. It was a monopoly which wouldn't be allowed today, and it helped in turn to create the Rockefeller oil monopoly. And this gave America's first industrial giants colossal power. These were the first people in human history, we must forget, whose businesses were worth more than most countries. People whose fortunes dwarfed anything that the Caesars or the Tudors or the Medici ever dreamed of. So being greedy, they used this power to engage in price fixing, naturally they formed a cartel. Their attitude was that they could charge whatever they liked for steel and oil and transporting goods on the railways. They knew that all American business was dependent on them and they'd made sure there was no competition. So they could ignore market forces and charge pretty much whatever they liked. Now this naturally caused resentment and it's very interesting that the press at that time started calling these first Illuminati bankers and industrialists robber barons. Of course, once these fortunes began to be made, others naturally tried to get in on the act. One who succeeded was J.P. Morgan, who became a private banker during this period. But modern critics have discovered that far from being the richest man in America everyone thought he was, it turned out upon his death that Morgan actually only owned 17% of Morgan Bank, and that like so many others, he was simply a front for the Rothschilds family. Five years after E. H. Harriman died and handed on the business to his sons, W. Averill Harriman and E. Roland Harriman, this new breed of Western business moguls faced their first really big test with the coming of World War I. Once again, we must never forget that this was the first time in human history that a truly global conflict had been fought. It was sure to have long-lasting international repercussions, and many observers at the time had their doubts as to whether Western industrial capitalism which was still in its infancy, could cope with the demands of war production. In the world economic recession which followed, many feared these fledgling industries might vanish altogether as countries struggled with debt and war reparations. But actually, Western capitalism emerged from World War I in a far stronger state than it was in at the beginning. So how could this be? The First World War taught the new class of international bankers and industrialists a very simple lesson. War is good for business. Take, for instance, Remington. We tend to associate their name with typewriters, but actually they made most of the rifles and handguns used during the Great War and made a colossal fortune in the process. The banks, in their turn, lapped this up because it meant that defence contractors were having no trouble repaying the huge loans they had outstanding and, best of all, the world's richest nations had had to borrow huge sums from the merchant bankers in the first place to finance the war the Americans and the British just as much as the Germans. And they would now be repaying these loans to the banks for decades to come at a steep rate of interest. For international merchant bankers, the Rothschilds in particular, the First World War had been a gift from heaven. And people watching this should ask themselves a simple question before passing judgment. Supposing you were in business during that war and the contract you had with the government to supply the troops with tin hats or boots or uniforms or gunpowder was netting you millions every year in profit. And then one day the war ended and your money stopped completely. What do you think your attitude to war might be? That war was good for business was not the only lesson the ruling classes learned during this period. The Russian Revolution of 1917 terrified rich people all over the world. Watching Lenin and Trotsky taking over such a vast area of the globe, the kings and queens of Europe's tiny sovereign states in particular became extremely nervous. The question on all their minds was, supposing the communist success in Russia should inspire their own working class to rise in revolt. Many of the crowned heads of Europe, like England's George V, had been related to Tsar Nicholas, and the brutal execution of the Tsar and his family, particularly the bayonetting of his young daughters, sent a shockwave through the upper classes of every nation. 
Did a similar fate lie in store for the royal families of Holland, Sweden, Spain and England? This question was lying heavily on the thoughts of the elite when the First World War ended in 1918 and it had the effect of focusing the minds of the new Illuminati bankers and industrialists on the question of what to do for best with a defeated and dilapidated Germany. The population were poor, penniless and worn out, yet the German economy still contained some of the most sophisticated and expensive industrial stock on the planet. The Illuminati sensed an opportunity. Supposing, as the world's first international businessmen, they could get their hands on Germany's steel mills, her coal mines, her factories, ports and her shipbuilding industry. Over the years, certain names have become very familiar to those who maintain an interest in the Kennedy assassination, none more so than Alan Dulles, whom Kennedy fired after the Bay of Pigs disaster, and yet later he somehow managed to chair the Warren Commission, which was supposed to be investigating Kennedy's death. Something few people know, however, is that Dulles and his older brother John Foster Dulles wrote the Treaty of Versailles. They were both lawyers of Sullivan and Cromwell, and it was largely they who decided that the German people must pay war reparations totalling 135 billion marks. A mind-boggling sum at that time, which today translates into 250 trillion. When this was announced, the legendary UK economist J. Maynard Keynes maintained it was a ludicrous sum, and he did a swift calculation from which he reasoned that it would take Germany until 1988, 60 years hard labour, to pay it off. But it didn't. So why? Maynard Keynes sensed that the Dulles brothers, backed as they were by the new Illuminati, were trying quite deliberately to sabotage the German economy. And they succeeded. As mass unemployment led to hyperinflation, the famous stories of people papering their walls with worthless Reichmarks and handing over their life savings for a loaf of bread soon followed. With German investors on their knees, the new Illuminati moved in and began buying up shares of stock in German industry at a knockdown price. Now, why did they do this? The cynical mind would say to make a buck, but it really wasn't that simple. What they wanted was to make Germany strong again so that she would become a bulwark against Soviet communism. Germany was fighting for its life. Certain measures were needed to protect it from its enemies. I cannot say that I am sorry we applied those measures. We were a bulwark against Bolshevism. We were a pillar of Western culture. A bulwark and a pillar the West may yet wish to retain. It was around this time that the newspapers, which these same rich people owned, made sure the word Bolshe, a truncation of Bolshevik, entered the English language, so that we would associate Bolshevism with aggression. And it was with these subtle and not-so-subtle methods that the international elite began to shape our destiny for the remainder of the 20th century. The intellectuals of the period were furious. They were incensed, they were depressed, and you get a very good feeling of the political atmosphere of the time from the diaries of the Labour politician Harold Nicholson when he writes, We have lost our willpower since our willpower is divided. The people of the governing class think only of their own fortunes, which means hatred of the Reds. Our class interests cut across our national interests and I go to bed in gloom. With such heavy investment coming into the country, particularly from America and Britain, Germany began to recover very rapidly. And then the new class of international financiers began searching around for a homegrown authoritarian political movement they could support. What they needed with someone they could count on to be both aggressive and expansionist. Ultra-right-wing causes, which at normal times would have been ignored and marginalised, were suddenly given very careful consideration, until finally the rich elite found a man and an idea which they felt might deliver the political outcome they desired. Adolf Hitler and his fledgling National Socialist Party. 
At the same time that the world's rich elite began grooming Hitler for his starring role, they also became even more deeply involved in military intelligence. I say even more because the Dulles brothers, Averill Harriman, and the chief of Remington, Samuel Bush, a man referred to as the original Merchant of Death, had a relationship with American military intelligence, stretching back into World War I. The lesson here being that the American variant of military intelligence started out with businessmen protecting their investments, just as if they were a mafia. Right from the very beginning, it had nothing to do with national security and everything to do with money. In Hitler... The Illuminati had found a ready-made stooge who could be the face of this autocratic new movement. And when the time came to put together a new secret intelligence service which was going to help protect all the money they had tied up in the German economy, these men also found one was readily available. The Order of the Skull and Bones at Yale University. Discussion of secret societies is something of a minefield because it so easily invites ridicule. It is very difficult for the general public to accept that the super-rich leaders of their Western world can possibly be as mad and deranged as they actually are. The public, generally speaking, are sensible and level-headed people who have to balance their checkbooks, so they inevitably tend to laugh at stories about Satanists and occult believers. But if you talk to any well-informed historians, they are all aware of the important role which various secret societies have played in human history. The Black Hand always played a pivotal role in the history of the Mafia. If you talk to anyone in the UK who was political and read books, they are always aware that the ruling class of Britain, including every member of the royal family, is a Freemason. And the emblem of the Death's Head was sported on the caps of the high-ranking Nazi officers from the very beginning. The symbols of these secret societies always seem to play around with some kind of skull and bones motif, so that it's abundantly clear what their mission statement is. These people are pirates, willing to commit any crime for big money, and they first became established in America at Yale University in 1833 with General William Huntington Russell and Alfonso Taft. Of course, being a secret society, they made other people curious about them, and in 1867, some undergraduates from a rival campus society broke into their headquarters to see what this skull and bones thing was all about. They reported that inside, there were lots of lamps and candles, many dilapidated human skulls lying next to a fool's cap and bells, and it was morbidly dark because the walls were covered in black velvet. Having established a suitably satanic atmosphere, initiation rites were then performed on new members who had to engage in group masturbation and sodomy while they lay in a coffin. Now it's very easy to dismiss all of this as bizarre, silly and irrelevant until you see the list of Skull and Bones members who have ruled America since Skull and Bones began. Although they only graduate 15 initiates a year, those 15 have always gone on to occupy the very highest positions in American society. US Secretary of State William Max Evarts was a bonesman, as was Treasury Secretary Franklin McVeigh, Chief Justice Simeon Eben Baldwin, and the 27th President of the United States, William Howard Taft, the founder of American football, Walter Camp, came through Skull and Bones, as did the very first chairman of the Federal Reserve, P.A.J., and director of Standard Oil, Percy Rockefeller. Averill Harriman, the son of E.H. Harriman and founder of Harriman Brothers, the largest investment bank in the world, was a bonesman, and so were both of the George Bush presidents. During his premiership, John F. Kennedy was surrounded by bondsmen like McGeorge Bundy and David Aitchison, son of Dean Aitchison. Kennedy knew these men refer to each other as brothers under the skin. They swear an oath of secrecy and then ruthlessly vow to help each other's careers in any way they can throughout their lives, even if it means committing murder. In Britain, every literate person knows that all of the top police officers are Freemasons. Because if there are ten candidates for a top job, a mason will always select a brother mason for the post. Skull and Bones works the same way, and JFK took this problem so seriously 
that he even made speeches warning America about the danger of secret societies. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically... He knew the people on this list were neither silly nor orders. irrelevant because he knew they were the real holders of power in America, operating as they were, as an unelected shadow government accountable to no one. And it was these same people who brought Hitler to power during the 1920s by becoming business partners with leading German industrialists. The reality of the situation prevailing at that time can be very easily understood simply by looking at the cover of Fritz Thiessen's book I Paid Hitler, on which he is depicted as a puppet master, controlling Hitler's strings. Thiessen was a billionaire industrialist. He was the man who built the Bismarck. His company, United Steelworks, made three quarters of all Germany's steel, and he joined together with Skull and Bones members Prescott Bush and George Herbert Walker to financially assist the Nazi party. Together they recruited head of the German central bank, Jean Marschacht, to the fascist cause, and then combined with other leading industrialists to sign the letter which convinced Hindenburg to appoint Hitler as Chancellor on the 20th of February 1933. Had anyone inquired around this time about the postal address of the Nazi party, they could legitimately have been told that it was 39 Broadway, Manhattan, New York, because this was where Averill Harriman, Prescott Bush and George Herbert Walker kept their office. And being no fool, Fritz Thiessen used their banking services to set up secret cash funds funneled through another bank in Rotterdam, the Bank voor Handel in Schaefvaart, to finance the building of the first official Nazi party headquarters, the Brown House. This was all done with the full cooperation of the Dutch bankers, who orchestrated this entire sinister business with the assistance of the Thiessen family lawyer, Alan Dulles. Of course, the Germans themselves were ecstatic. We've all seen the newsreels from that time in which they are stomping around in their jackboots, acting like a master race, because they had swallowed the propaganda that they were being led to glory by a superman who had rebuilt the economy and Germany's infrastructure all by himself. This was a lie. Hitler didn't have any money. You can only build autobahns with one thing, capital investment, and that investment came mainly from America. The Nazis were also given a lot of help from the city of London, help which came mainly in the shape of Sir Montague Collett Norman, Governor of the Bank of England. Norman was connected to Bush and Walker through the merger of Harriman's with the Brown Brothers, who traded in London as Brown Shipley, hence Brown Brothers Harriman. The people behind this multinational investment bank had a long-standing racial tradition. Few British people at the time were aware that they only enjoyed relatively cheap clothing because it was all made from slave cotton brought from America on the Brown Brothers ships and sold to British mill owners. Montague Norman was heir to this colossal Brown Brothers fortune. As the de facto head of world banking, he made no secret of his only being interested in the richest 1% of people. And even as the newspapers began to fill with stories of Nazi concentration camps, he still declared himself to be Hitler's most avid supporter. We must lend Nazi Germany 90 million marks, he declared. It may never be repaid, but it will be less of a loss than the fall of Nazism. One might have thought Sir Montague's close personal friends, the royal family, would have been outraged by his comments. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is part of the remit of this film to try and make people aware of the tricks the rich play in order to control how we think. George Orwell once said that the ruling class in every age have tried to impose a false view of the world upon their followers. And there's no better example than the way in which the British have been duped into believing that their royal family are called Windsor and descend from English kings like Henry VIII. The British royal family are actually German and their real name is Saxe-Coburg-Gotha. The only change it to Windsor after Windsor Castle in 1917 to hide the fact that they were German during the First World War. Prince Harry, in honour of his German roots, has been known to dress as a Nazi on several occasions. Dozens of critics have pointed out that the Duke of Edinburgh's brother was the head of the Nazi SS. And King Edward VIII, 
before he abdicated to marry the American divorcee Wallace Simpson, visited Hitler to make it abundantly clear to the whole world that he too was a Nazi. He even signed his name Herzog von Windsor. Thinking people during this period realised that this whole thing with kissing up to the Fuhrer somehow transcended national boundaries. The rich people from the most diverse countries had bonded together because they all shared a common goal. The kings and the queens and the international bankers and industrialists wanted to make certain communism could never succeed. They were determined they weren't going to finish up like the Russian royal family and they were determined to hang on to their money. They were much more afraid of the ordinary working people in their own countries than they were of fascist Germany. And this prevailing sentiment amongst the world's ruling class led America's elite to attempt a fascist coup d'etat in 1934. I hope it will be plain to people by now that Hitler's economic miracle is the greatest myth in human history. There was no economic miracle. There are no miracles. And if there are, why can't the Germans do it all again now? If you want to construct a network of new roads and new steelworks and new factories, you need one thing, money. You need investment. And the investment didn't come from Hitler. It came from Brown Brothers Harriman and their business associate, Fritz Thiessen. It came from Jalmar Schacht and his best friend, Sir Montague Collett Norman. It came from men like Axel Wenegren, the Swedish multimillionaire arms manufacturer, and Charles Bedeau, the French business mogul. These people were all in the same bed with their Nazi friends, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, the Dulles brothers, Prescott Sheldon Bush, and George Herbert Walker, with whom they'd created the Union Bank for laundering Nazi money. And with stage one of their plan for world domination complete, they now turned to the second phase, which was meant to be the overthrow of American democracy and the imposition of fascist government upon the United States. In order to pull this off, these Nazis raised money from America's richest families, many of whom, in this new consumerist society, had become household names. The Colgate family, the Birdseye family, the DuPont family, the Rockefeller family. These people handed over millions to the American financiers of Hitler so they could hire, train and supply a private army which would attempt to overthrow the democratically elected government of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and impose fascist dictatorship in America. Of course, it's natural to wonder, considering they had such advantages, how on earth they failed to pull it off. The simple answer is that they chose the wrong man, because their choice to lead this Nazi insurrection was Major General Smedley Darlington Butler, the most decorated soldier of the period and in all of American history, perhaps the most unsung hero of all. Because Smedley Butler was the most genuine Democrat and lover of liberty the world has ever seen. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under the subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government and break down our democratic institutions. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men which would be able to take over the functions of government. My main interest in all this is to preserve our democratic institution. I want to retain the right to vote, I the right to speak freely, and the right to write. If we maintain these basic principles, our democracy is safe. No dictatorship can exist with suffrage, freedom of speech, and press. Smedley Butler tricked the plotters into thinking he was interested for just long enough until he was sure who all the major players were and then he told the president. This put FDR in a quite impossible position. America at that time was just coming out of the Great Depression. The last thing he wanted was to cause another economic downturn and he feared that if he scooped up all the leading bankers and captains of industry in the United States and threw them all in jail, the country just might fall apart. So what could he do? To Smedley Butler's utter incredulity, he chose, in the end, to do nothing. In spite of the fact that these men had committed treason and should have been hanged, their power was such that they were not even charged, let alone tried, 
and so great was their influence, they were able to keep America out of the war until December the 7th, 1941. With the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt finally realised he had to do something. His response was the Trading with the Enemy Act, which allowed him to seize assets like the Union Bank, through which Bush, Walker and Harriman had been financing Thiessen. Roosevelt didn't realise, however, that it was already a case of too little, too late. Because without his knowledge, American business moguls had been tumbling over one another for two years in their efforts to assist and do business with the Hitler regime. Typical of this American spirit of enterprise was Sosthenes Ben, the president of AT&T, who flew immediately to Berlin when war was declared to put in Hitler's phone lines. He gave the Nazis the most high-tech, state-of-the-art telecommunication system in the world at that time so that Hitler could rule the European mainland with the maximum efficiency. Rich men have been hiring thugs to do their dirty work, especially to frighten people, since human civilization began. What people have to try to appreciate is that Nazism, in reality, was simply the first time in human history that the rich had enough wealth to hire an entire country of thugs to do their dirty work. Some of the most emotive images in world history are those of the Nazi war machine sweeping across the Low Countries to begin their occupation of France. And people have always assumed that the trucks used for the miles-long troop convoys must have been German trucks. But if anyone at that time had taken the trouble to lift up the cowling and look at the engine, they would have found these were actually Ford trucks which had been built with personal permission from Henry Ford, who was sitting in his office 4,000 miles away in Dearborn, Michigan, a service for which he was given the Grand Cross of the Eagle, the highest honour the Nazis ever bestowed on a civilian. Ford sued the U.S. Army, uh, the U.S. Uh, government in, uh, in the 50s because during the war the U.S. Uh, Air Force bombed their tank-making fac facilities in Germany. And they, this is true. And what was it, like 52 or something, they sued the U.S. government for, for destroying their factories. And they won. They won the lawsuit. So I had to write a little song for Henry here. Ford built tanks for the Nazis, and the Nazis used those tanks to gun down lots of soldiers in the U.S. Army ranks. Yes, Henry Ford was a fascist and a nasty one, was he? He built tanks for anyone for the proper fee. Henry Ford... Hitler so admired Henry Ford, he kept a life-size portrait of him on the wall next to his desk, and even his legendary Panzer tanks were tainted by these sorts of practices, because they were made by I.G. Farben who had entered into a cartel with the Rockefellers' Standard Oil. The government in Washington knew all about this, and largely did nothing. Licensing arrangements for trading with the enemy in wartime were issued without any fuss, even to the extent that after the occupation of France, the Chase and Morgan banks in Paris simply carried on doing business as usual. The incredible truth, which the rich elite have managed to hide from the world for 70 years through their control over school books and our education system, is that the Nazi war machine was actually an American business. And for the Rockefellers, DuPonts, Harrimans, Walkers and Bushes in particular, it was a highly lucrative business. For their part, Coca-Cola's contribution to the war effort was to sell billions of soft drinks to the thirsty Nazis while they were strafing and bombing Allied soldiers, particularly in very hot regions. In the desert, where refrigerators tend to be scarce, there were even stories of Messerschmitt pilots wrapping wet towels around bottles of Coke, tying them to their aircraft, then flying up to altitude, where the cold and the wind chill turned the wet towel into a solid block of ice. They would then dive down, crack open the towel, and enjoy an ice-cold coke in the desert. If they had wanted to, the Western multinationals could have grounded the Luftwaffe 
and stop the war at any time because the German aircraft were totally dependent on imported supplies of tetraethyl lead, an additive which prevents knocking in aero engines. But Standard Oil kept the supply of this vital resource going through neutral Switzerland for the entire war. And any Dutch people who might be wondering at this point what kind of percentage the Swiss took from this little arrangement, they need to be aware that thanks to Prince Bernhard von Lippe of the Netherlands, the father of the recently retired Queen Beatrix and prominent member of the Nazi party, Royal Dutch Shell gave Hitler millions of tonnes of crude oil for nothing. The Dutch royal family actually fuelled the invasion force which annexed Holland and were instrumental in helping the Nazis to rape their own country. But most shocking of all is the truth of what really happened in the little Polish town of Odzwitzim. This sleepy little hamlet just happened to be in an extremely mineral-rich region, particularly for coal, which Western industrialists had wanted to get their hands on for years. With the coming of the Hitler regime and the invasion of Poland, the fascist financiers had the bright idea of turning this conquered region into an investor's paradise by building a Nazi concentration camp near the town and utilising the slave labour available to drastically reduce their own production costs. Few people are aware of the gigantic scale of the Nazi concentration camp network and are blissfully unaware that the real purpose behind their construction was to make a profit for the rich which is why they stole all the gold watches, gold wedding rings and gold teeth fillings and melted them down into gold ingots. To this day, there are bars of gold lying in the vaults of the Bank of England, which have the Nazi swastika stamped on them. Gold stolen from Jewish corpses. It shouldn't come as any great surprise that George Herbert Walker's family were slave owners on the cotton plantations of 1930s America. Walker was used to organising slave labour. So while his business associate, Averill Harriman, was paying for Hitler's half million SS troops and supplying them all with brand new Thompson submachine guns, because he did, Walker took over the management of this new Polish concentration camp. And when his Nazi friends started complaining that they couldn't pronounce the name Oswitzium any better than I can, they all got together and decided they had better Germanise the name into something which sat more comfortably on Nazi tongues. It was in this way that the world first heard of Auschwitz. Because the truth about Auschwitz and the entire Nazi war machine is that they were essentially no different to McDonald's. They were American business enterprises abroad, businesses which the richest European families invested in and businesses which because of slave labour, made obscene profits, which Prescott Sheldon Bush took and placed in a blind trust, which later financed a Bush political dynasty, which produced two presidents of the United States, his son, George Herbert Walker Bush, and his grandson, George Walker Bush. This picture of the railway leading into Auschwitz has, since World War II, become the iconic image of the Holocaust. To us, it now represents something like the gate to hell, but how differently, one wonders, would we have looked at this image all of our lives if we had always known that this railway line was an American railway line laid by the Harriman brothers on behalf of Uncle Sam. The Standard Oil IG Farben cartel even made the Zyklon B gas for the Jewish Holocaust. Now anyone who at this point is thinking that all this simply cannot be true because if it was, someone would have sued, well someone did. This information came into the public domain because of a Dutch intelligence agent who was so disgusted when he found all of this out he leaked it to the press, as a result of which two very senior Jewish gentlemen, Kurt Julius Goldstein and Peter Gingold, filed suit against the American government. Of course, the more discriminating among us will now be asking how it can be that this story went completely unreported in the mainstream media. One might just as well ask why the Times in London was writing favourable stories about the Nazi concentration camps throughout the 1930s, and why Lord Rothmere was still referring to Hitler as a great gentleman as late as 1940. You really would think by now that people would have realised that it isn't so much the bias in the media which really matters, it's the things they know about, but never tell you, 
that really matter. Because the truth is that the press knew exactly what was going on in the concentration camps all through the war. They never said a word about it because they knew who was making money from the slave labor. Now, it's very easy to imagine what the response of a conservative politician, American or British, would be to all of this. If all of this is true, he's bound to ask why nobody said a word about American industrialists building Hitler's war machine at the Nuremberg trials. How come it never got mentioned? Where's the responsibility of the Vatican, who signed in 1933 the Concordat with Hitler? giving him his first tremendous prestige. Are we now to find the Vatican guilty? Where's the responsibility of the world leader Winston Churchill, who said in an open letter to the London Times in 1938, 1938, your honor, were England to suffer national disaster, I should pray to God to send a man of the strength of mind and will of an Adolf Hitler. Are we now to find Winston Churchill guilty? Where's the responsibility of those American industrialists who helped Hitler to rebuild his armaments and profited by that rebuilding? Are we now to find the American industrialists guilty? No, Your Honor, no. Germany alone is not guilty. The whole world is as responsible for Hitler as Germany. It is an easy thing to condemn one man in the dark. It is easy to condemn the German people to speak of the basic flaw in the German character that allowed Hitler to rise to power, but at the same time, comfortably, ignore the basic flaw of character that made the Russians sign pacts with him, Winston Churchill praise him, American desolates profit by him, American desolates profit by him, 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 profit by him. In school, we are taught that the Allies defeated Nazi Germany in World War II. This is not true. The Nazis won the war because the real Nazis, the rich, played on both sides. That's what a rich businessman does. He arranges things so that he is well thought of by both sides, so then whoever wins, he wins, and his money is safe. Now, a lot of people will still think it is simply ludicrous to suggest the Second World War was a phony war. They are bound to say that no one who was there at the time thought it was a phony war. Really? A new baby, 200 gross of buckles, unlimited petrol and all the whiskey you want. You're sitting pretty, aren't you, Holden? Yes, it is a lovely war. Well, wouldn't you if you were in my place? Wouldn't everybody? Doesn't everybody? It was a blasted phony anyway. I'm a bit tired of that. Tired of what? This phony war business. Well, isn't it? No, it's not. I've just come out of hospital after ten days in an open boat off the Faroes, and I'm sick and tired of blokes like you with soft jobs ashore. Come outside. Now, don't be silly. I've lost two fingers off that hand, but I'm going to take you outside and knock your block off with my right. Ah, oh, take it easy. There's no need for that. I'm sorry, I apologize. I'll come outside if you insist. That won't do any good. It's not his fault. It's the fault of all of us. You make me sick. All of you. It may be a phony war to you, but it's not to all the boys at sea. It never has been. Now, obviously, the British, and the Dutch in particular, will have a very hard time accepting that their royal family profited from Nazi concentration camp slave labor. But if you go online, there is so much about this on the internet now. It's become plain that historians are more and more proving that those days were really all about the Western world's rich coming together to fund a Nazi war machine which was meant to protect them from the Soviets. The Duke of Edinburgh practically admitted this when he said, in those days we were anti-communist because the Russians killed half my bloody family. 
And when this cabal of secret Nazis got together to discuss how they were going to pay for this Nazi war machine, because rich people never accept a loss, they hired a psychopath, Hitler, who they knew would go along with their building concentration camps so that slave labor would pay for all the planes and the tanks and the guns. And you can see in the more intelligent movies from that period, like Hitchcock's Saboteur, that the artists and writers of that time knew the rich were fascist and completely understood what they were really up to. Why is it that you sneer every time you refer to this country? You've done pretty well here. I don't get it. No, you wouldn't. You're one of the ardent believers, a good American. Oh, there are millions like you, people that plod along without asking questions. I hate to use the word stupid, but it seems to be the only one that applies. The great masses, the moron millions. Well, there are a few of us who are unwilling to just troop along. A few of us who are clever enough to see that there's much more to be done than just live small, complacent lives. A few of us in America who desire a more profitable type of government. When you think about it, Mr. Kane, the competence of totalitarian nations is much higher than ours. They get things done. Yeah, they get things done. They bomb cities, sink ships, torture and murder so you and your friends can eat off of gold plate. It's a great philosophy. I neither intend to be bombed nor sunk, Mr. Kane. That's why I'm leaving now. And if things don't go right for you, if uh, we should win, then I'll come back. Perhaps I can get what I want then. Power. Yes. I want that as much as you want your comfort or your job or, or that girl. We all have different tastes, as you can see. Only I'm willing to back my tastes with the necessary force. Where was the Mafia while all this was going on? Well, a great deal which historians have learned recently, especially from sources like Double Cross, the book written by Sam Giancarlo's brother, has made it clear that the Mafia was much the same as the so-called German economic miracle and the American finance Nazi war machine and concentration camps. The mob in reality was a very different animal from the one portrayed by the movies and the media American feature films have tended to focus on the exploits of gangsters like Richard Kane, the famous crime-busting Chicago cop who was planted in the police force to be a spy for Giancana, and hoods like Charles Nicoletti and Milwaukee Phil Alderisio, two of his favourite hitmen who built their own hitmobile so they could shoot people from the back of a moving car. Amongst many other atrocities this pair committed was one in which they forced the head of Billy McCarthy into a vice and squeezed until his eyeball popped out. An incident which a certain American film director felt was so entertaining, he included it in one of his movies. What most people have failed to realise, however, is that in most cases, the Mafia chieftains who actually ran organised crime did not approve, generally speaking, of these acts of gross brutality. Not that they gave a damn about morals, but the cleverest amongst them, like Paul the Waiter Rica, realised that sensationalised events like the St. Valentine's Day Massacre produced public outrage and a crackdown on their illegal activities. Rico realised that the effectiveness of mobsters like Diamond Joe Esposito came from keeping a low profile. And it was the Mafia bosses who learned this lesson best, Santos Traficante and Sam Giancana in particular, who in later years became the most successful. Even today, few Americans appreciate the extent to which their country was being controlled by organised crime in the 1930s. The mob were in total control of Hollywood because all the union labour needed to make films, carpenters, set construction, catering, they were all under the control of the mob. In particular, the control of the Teamsters Union, the drivers and haulage people who made essential deliveries to absolutely everyone meant that virtually all American business was caught in the web of Mafia racketeering. Studio bosses like Harry Cohn, Louis B. Mayer and the Warner Brothers knew they had to play along to get anything done at all. The big studio heads, like all rich businessmen, found they were forced to become friends with Mafia dons. And the individual who exploited this situation most effectively was a gangster few people have ever heard of. 
Murray the Camel Humphreys. Generally speaking, the ethnically Italian gangsters of this period were coarse, brutal and most importantly ignorant men. They had no education. They couldn't hold an intelligent conversation because they'd spent no time in school. Don Colleon, I am honoured and grateful that you have invited me to your daughter's wedding. On the day of your daughter's wedding. This made doing business with refined and sophisticated entrepreneurs difficult, not to say embarrassing. And Sam Giancana was quick to spot this. So whenever a business deal needed to be made by someone with style and sophistication, he would send along his silver-tongued Welshman, Murray the Camel, so-called because he was known for being sartorial and for cutting a dash in expensive camel hair coats. Humphreys became a crucial figure during the pre-war period because his contact with the luminaries of Hollywood meant he received invitations from senior politicians who wanted to rub shoulders with stars like Clark Gable, George Raft, Cary Grant, Gary Cooper, Marilyn Monroe and Frank Sinatra, all of whom were mafia controlled and used by the mob as bag men, moving colossal sums of money around the country. Because Giancana cynically realised the authorities were too starstruck to ever check their luggage. He even used a priest for the same purpose, who he referred to as Father Cash. And just as the priest was happy to take his percentage, so the politicians, who Giancana always maintained were the easiest to corrupt, were happy to do the same. In Esposito's time, he had boasted of buying votes for Calvin Coolidge. By the time of World War II, Sam Giancana was boasting to his younger brother, we own the White House. He was adamant that every state governor, congressman and senior judge in the country was on the take, and the mob's most spectacular success, as they sought control over all the big players, was their corrupting of FBI director J. Edgar Hoover. It's become fairly widely known in recent years that Hoover was a transvestite homosexual. What is less well known is the elaborate scheme he dreamed up for accepting mafia bribes. What he used to do was to go to the $2 window at the racetrack where he was photographed many times by the press to give himself a clean, upstanding image. What the pressmen didn't know was that he always took along a crooked emissary who placed huge bets which ran into the thousands at another window on races which were fixed by the mob boss Frank Costello. By keeping Hoover supplied with millions in winnings and holding on to compromising photographs of the FBI chief having sex with his lover, Clyde Tolson, which several CIA agents claim they've seen, the Mafia had American law enforcement entirely under their control. So the question then is, what do you do with that kind of power? The answer is that when you're the American Mafia, you routinely wipe out what they call do-gooders. This is how organised crime has influenced American society for nearly a century. If a decent man becomes a rising star in politics and looks as if he might try to make a better life for ordinary people, they simply kill him as a matter of routine. And in the book they wrote together, Chuck and Sam Giancana Jr. are at pains to point out that a classic early case of this practice was the assassination of Anton Shermack. Shermack was a democratic politician who had tried to crack down on Al Capone's bootlegging operations. Many felt he would go on to become a great president himself until he was shot while on stage with FDR by Giuseppe Zangara. After the murder Zangara claimed it was a political act and he ought to be entitled to clemency because he simply hated all rich people. But this was actually what he'd simply been told to say by the mob who were using him as a fall guy. When he went to the electric chair, Sam Giancana turned to his brother and expressed his pleasure at how nice and neat the whole affair had been. And he further explained that choosing a patsy to wipe out a politician who was a do-gooder was something the Italian mafia had been doing forever. It was a practice as old as the Sicilian hills. And he was amazed at how the mafia kept getting away with it because you really would think people would catch on. This was 1935. You have a decent chief executive, murdered, in broad daylight, shot by a patsy, who was later killed himself by the authorities. 
Does this sound familiar? However, even in Schirmack's time, the mob could not be said to be in complete control of American life. Because while they controlled the streets through their influence over politics and the justice system, they were not yet in control of the United States military or its mainstream media. Tragically, this all started to change with a series of events which began with the scuttling of the SS Normandy by a Manhattan-based Nazi agent. This was February the 9th, 1942. And having just joined the war, the United States was trying to keep its allies supplied with vital war material using convoys which were loaded on the waterfront and sailed almost every day out of New York Harbor. As everyone knows, many fell prey to the wolf packs of German U-boats, and the Normandy had been designed for much greater speed specifically so that she could outrun them. When she fell to sabotage, it was a colossal blow to the Allied war effort, and in response, a naval intelligence officer, Anthony Marslow, decided to enlist the help of the New York Mafia because he knew they were in control of all commercial activity on the docks. The subterfuge by foreign intelligence agents ceased, but the price America paid was calamitous because getting the Mafia's help meant getting permission from the boss of bosses, Lucky Lucanio. It is one of history's great ironies that the United States government when crawling to the Mafia for help at a moment when the mob themselves had just been severely weakened and could have been crushed altogether by an administration with enough political will. The notorious Lucanio had just started a 40-year prison sentence in Great Meadow Penitentiary, and most of his Sicilian gangsters back home were already behind bars, having been caught up in Mussolini's Mafia purge. Being himself Italian, Mussolini knew there was only one way to deal with the Mafia, and when he came to power, he ordered his iron prefect, Cesare More, to simply lock up all the Mafia families in Sicily, which wasn't exactly difficult because everybody knew who they were. Of course, after the Allied invasion of Sicily, Marsler then compounded his error by choosing Sicilian Americans like New York Mayor Charles Paletti and OSS officer Joseph Russo, whose father was born in Corleone, to head AMGOT, the Allied military government, whose job it was to restore community cohesion on the island. And of course, their way of doing this was not only to let all the mafiosi out of jail, they even made known mob bosses like Genco Russo and Don Calogero Vizzini into the heads of local government and gave them full civilian and military power over the island. So this was the accident of history through which the Mafia began its relationship with American military intelligence. It was a catastrophe for Italy, which has been ruled over by organised crime ever since. It was a catastrophe for Sicily, which suffered a brutal murder every three days in the post-war period, and it was a catastrophe for America, which saw many once vibrant communities, particularly in New Jersey, have the heart ripped out of them by Mafia extortion and drug dealing. Lucky Luciano was deported after being released from jail and having found a kindred spirit in another secret organisation, the newly created Central Intelligence Agency, he was then able to combine the activities of organised crime, particularly international drug running, with smuggling of American-made weapons. This unholy alliance gave the world its first ever pirates who flew aeroplanes. That's what these people became. Pirates with aeroplanes. The CIA became the world's primary import-export of narcotics and used the colossal profits to fuel wars around the world, thereby enabling their friends in the military-industrial complex to sell yet more weapons. Under the disguise of liberal democracy, these men, who had financed Hitler, became the enemies of liberty and democracy on a planet-wide basis. And as if to underline their Nazi credentials, they also hired all of the former German Nazi intelligence officers, like Reinhard Galen, who were out of a job at the end of the war and brought them into the fold at the beginning of the Cold War, even though they were perfectly well aware that these men had committed genocide and should have been prosecuted as war criminals. Their attitude, quite clearly, was that as they had paid for Nazi Germany, they were entitled to pick over its carcass in any way they chose. This was yet another political catastrophe for the United States. Because these were the people who put together the notorious Operation Paperclip, which rounded up all of the Nazi rocket scientists, like Werner von Braun, and put them to work for their new American Nazi owners to give them, for the first time in human history, ICBMs with nuclear warheads. 
They became the first men ever to have the power to destroy the whole world at the touch of a button. And it was clear to many observers at the time that it all rather went to their heads. I can no longer sit back and allow communist infiltration, communist indoctrination, communist subversion, and the international communist conspiracy to sap and impurify all of our precious bodily fluids. They saw themselves as giants who were looking down and laughing upon this planet of tiny fools who were stupid enough to go on and on killing each other while they sold arms to both sides throughout the Second World War. Fock Wolf aeroplanes, which bombed American soldiers, were manufactured by IT&T. Allied sailors were drowning in a freezing North Atlantic because their convoys were sunk by guns of Nazi battleships, which swivelled on American-made ball bearings. American soldiers were crushed under the wheels of tanks and trucks made by Henry Ford and John Rockefeller, and gassed to death by the same people. Sam Giancana took the trouble to explain how this cynical process worked by composing just one terse, simple sentence which his brother wrote down for posterity. People give their lives, he said, just so a few fat cats can make a killing. And this was precisely what Spedley Butler had tried to explain to the world with his book, War is Just a Racket. At the war's end, the rich elite found fortune continuing to smile on them. Firstly, they were able to control the utter farce of the Nuremberg trials, which should have hanged every single American merchant banker and leading industrialist. As it was, their contribution to World War II remained hidden from public scrutiny, and they were even allowed to gerrymander light sentences for their German Nazi friends, like Jean Marchacht, who got off with just a few years and later retired as a billionaire. But best of all was that the one man who might have been a check to their power passed away as soon as the war was over. And with President Roosevelt gone, and their first Nazi glove puppet Hitler also deceased, it became necessary for Prescott Bush to find another young politician to sponsor. In true American fashion, he decided to advertise. He placed an ad in the LA Times which candidly explained that a group of rich businessmen were seeking a young, ambitious, immoral and most definitely malleable politician who might one day run for president. The ad was deliberately worded in this cynical way because they knew that only an evil, slimy and completely incorrigible little creep would ever dream of applying for the position. That was what they wanted and that was what they got in the shape of a certain Richard Nixon here being congratulated on his success by his new master, Prescott Bush. And not long after this picture was taken, in 1947, Nixon engaged the services of a Jewish gangster who was working for Sam Giancana called Jacob Rubenstein, a man whom the world would one day come to know as Jack Ruby. Having bought themselves a new political puppet, this nefarious band of 20th century robber barons now took stock of their situation. The Hitler Project, as this Richard Lee called it, could hardly have turned out very much better. Their businesses had made colossal profits. Prescott had got his Union Bank back. The communist menace they so wanted to contain had almost sunk back in the Middle Ages with the ravages of war. And best of all was that they had now achieved the very world domination which Hitler had dreamed about. They knew that in this new age of modern telecommunications and high-speed jet travel, they had become the first group of robber barons in human history to dominate the entire globe because they realised there was now absolutely no one left who could stop them from doing whatever they wanted to do next. However, they also realised that bombed out and dilapidated Europe would not be able to bear another war for many decades. This was why they now decided that their obscene business profits could only keep coming in if they moved their game of phony war into the third world. And this was how the CIA came to instigate conflict throughout the Middle East, Southeast Asia and Central America. Chuck Giancana well remembers a conversation which he had with his Mafia boss brother Sam during this period in which he questioned him with genuine anxiety about the communist menace spreading throughout the world. The TV news was painting a sinister picture of a Soviet enemy with millions of fifth columnists which was intent upon taking over the entire planet. Hadn't he heard of the domino theory and wasn't he worried about it? In response, Sam Giancana simply smiled at his kid brother's naivety 
and he asked him, didn't he realise that the United States, by which he meant the shadow government, not the official one, wanted to take over the world as well? And that the whole idea of communism was just the excuse they were using to do it? He told him that in China they had already succeeded in getting a member of the Chinese mafia, a brutal gangster called Mao Zedong, into power just so they could sell more cigarettes in Asia. Communism was just their excuse. And it was pretty much the same story in the Philippines, with a crooked politician the Mafia levered into power called Ferdinand Marcos. As for the United States, Big Brother Sam explained that the Fat Cats were fully aware that Americans will do anything for patriotism. Hence, you must always provide them with an enemy, a boogeyman. They won't overwork themselves just to make huge profits for Fat Cats for any other reason, so new enemies had to be found or created. This is what Joe McCarthy's Reds Under the Bed Scare had really been all about. And they used the same excuse in Laos, Chile, Guatemala, El Salvador, Iran, Honduras, Vietnam and Cuba. If a small country refused to go along with American business interests, which basically meant with the rights of Western multinationals to pay slave wages to third world peasant farmers growing commodities like tobacco or sugar or fruit, They simply labelled them as communist, assassinated the democratically elected head of state with teams recruited from their secret societies, the Central Intelligence Agency and the Mafia, and put in a man favourable to their interests, as with the Shah in Iran. Simple. And even more to this, Giancarlo explained to his brother that the political game at home had to be played in the same way as the phony war game abroad. The lesson was that a businessman always protects his interests by playing both sides. Sam Giancana knew that the Second World War had been exactly the same as all the CIA's covert wars during the 1950s. They were conducted in order to make more money for the super-rich, because in every case they were selling weapons and fuel to both sides just as they had the Germans. On the American mainland, this cynical attitude manifests itself in the way the gangsters supported the campaigns of both leading candidates in every political head-to-head, in order to make sure that whoever got elected, he was always their man and on their side. So this was the real political world, which the young Senator John F. Kennedy became a part of in 1950s America. It was a world ruled by a super-rich cabal of secret Nazis who had built the fascist war machine and concentration camps purely to protect themselves and their money from socialist Russia. Having avoided prosecution for the greatest crime in human history, they were confident that they could kill anyone and get away with it, particularly if it was someone who might interfere with their power to instigate phony wars in order to make huge fortunes by lending money and selling weapons to both sides. The war in which he himself had bravely fought was a sham, and even John F. Kennedy did not understand this. Or perhaps we should say that he didn't fully understand what was going on. He and his younger brother Bobby were certainly all too keenly aware of the extent to which their country was in the grip of organised crime because their own father, the patriarch Joseph P. Kennedy, had made his personal fortune from running illegal liquor during the days of Prohibition, activities which earned him the nickname Bootlegger Joe. Experienced people are aware that the tendency of each new generation to reject the ideas of the previous generation is an abiding characteristic in human affairs, and it is perfectly plain that with Jack and Bobby it had the effect of making both men highly principled. Their own father had associated with crooks and gangsters, and it was quite clear from their style and their outlook that they had made a commitment to make up for the sins of their father by rejecting this sinister world of hoods and crooks and corrupt politicians, by being honest and decent. If you take a look at any group photo from the early days, it's clear these men are being determinedly clean-cut, with the accent heavily on the clean part. They knew their father's generation were dirty. It couldn't be more obvious that they were determined to be the opposite. The question was, how were they going to free themselves and their country from the entanglements of the crooked politicians and the psychopathic mafia dons who together were controlling the whole of American life like some multi-legged fascist octopus? 
How they were going to pull this off was something they were discussing ad nauseam when, in the late 1950s, they found out their father was in big trouble. A contract had been taken out on Joe Kennedy's life by the Purple Gang, the Jewish Mafia of New York, who had accused him of swindling them out of a fortune. Joe Kennedy was really scared, and he turned for help toward the one man in North America who he knew had the power to get the contract called off, Sam Giancana. Giancana had done business with Kennedy for years, so he agreed to help, but... He wanted something for it. He was all too aware of Joe's political ambitions for his son and of JFK's outstanding good looks. He wanted assurances that if Jack one day made it to the White House, Joe Kennedy would see to it that the heat the two brothers had been trying to turn up on the Mafia would be turned down. And, according to Chuck and Sam Giancana Jr., Joseph P. Kennedy, just to save his own skin, agreed. Will you tell us anything about any of your operations? Or you just uh, like, giggle every time I ask you a question? I decline to answer because I always believe my answer might tend to incriminate me. I thought only little girls giggled with the Gene Connor. <laughs> In this way, a very confused situation was created because Sam Gene Connor, the very kind of mob boss whom the Kennedys had been fighting so hard through the McClellan Committee to put in jail, now thought that they should and would be grateful to him. It was this expectation and this misunderstanding which now led Giancana to try to draw the Kennedys more and more into his dark world, something which he appeared to be succeeding with in the way that first Peter Lawford and then Frank Sinatra established relationships with both men. Lawford married Kennedy's sister. Everyone is voting for Jack. Sinatra was putting together campaigning jingles, and it must have seemed to many insiders at the time that when Sam Giancana went around boasting that, as usual, he had everything under control, and that when Jack got to the White House, it was going to be a dream ticket for the Mafia, that it must all be true. His boys appeared to be partying together. And those who were in the know were aware that JFK had at least some sort of relationship with Judith Campbell Exner, Sam Giancana's girlfriend. What we haven't known until now is that JFK was hoodwinking Giancana all along. The role that Judy Campbell played was mostly that of a go-between. What Kennedy was doing through her was giving Giancana FBI reports on mob bosses to make him think that law enforcement were not all that well informed about the Mafia scams and their movements, nor even terribly interested. What Giancana did not know was that the FBI reports he was receiving were carefully selected and most definitely incomplete. Kennedy was not helping Giancana. He was not keeping him in the picture. What he was doing was pulling the wool over his eyes. For the first time in his life, Sam Giancana was perplexed, and he became more confused when there was a sudden freezing over of relations. JFK abruptly ended his relationship with Sinatra, and Judy Campbell suddenly found the White House were refusing her calls. Even more to this, Giancana's limitations were shown up in the way he completely failed to comprehend that Kennedy truly was decent and honest. He apparently had many conversations with Murray the Camel Humphreys around this time, in which both were reassuring each other that Kennedy's white knight lifestyle was just a political game to make him look good. Quite clearly, this cynical outlook was the product of living in their dark and corrupt world. They had never known an honest and decent man, because in the Mafia, there's no such thing. There is no record of what was said during the three meetings which JFK had with Giancana and his father at the Fontainebleau Hotel, just prior to the 1960 general election. But it does now seem that in this most titanic battle of wits between the craftiest criminal in America and the most brilliant politician the world had ever seen, Kennedy had won. He had played the Mafia at their own game and played it better. Why did John F. Kennedy do this? Because he must have known just what a dangerous game he was playing. There certainly appears to be no doubt, now that we ourselves are aware of the all-pervading influence of organised crime in America at that time, that this brave and decent and honest man had realised that he could never get rid of the Mafia and their dirty fascist friends in politics, industry and banking without first enlisting their help. He had to trick them. 
And with this new understanding, we can now see, for the first time, with the correct perspective, the motives, characters, intrigues and diverse political interests which were gathering against President Kennedy when he took the oath of office. Organised crime were fearful of JFK before he ascended to power because the shrewdest amongst them were getting a sense that he had outfoxed and outmaneuvered the all-powerful mafia bosses. But the big mistake researchers have made in the past has been to not understand that every American oligarch, the big oil men, the captains of industry, the merchant bankers, the intelligence chiefs were all crooks and gangsters as well. The biggest crook in the land was the head of law enforcement, J. Edgar Hoover. This is what historians have failed to understand until now. When JFK appointed his 32-year-old kid brother to the post of Attorney General, these people collectively froze. It now fully hit home that JFK really was honest and decent. It hit home that he wanted to make his country as honest and decent as he was, and that he actually believed that with the help of his energetic and determined crime-busting brother that he could do it. His attitude, of course, stood in marked contrast to the man whom Kennedy was saddled with as his running mate. Anyone who has any doubts about the moral rectitude of the average American politician of that time has only to look at the career of Lyndon Baines Johnson to see that, generally speaking, they were worse than the Mafia itself. From his involvement with the Box 13 scandal and through all of his dealings with his crooked Texan business associate, Billy Solestes, LBJ proved again and again that he was every bit as unscrupulous as any more boss and willing to do absolutely anything for power. This was a man who'd had his own sister, Josepha, murdered by his personal hitman, a highly intelligent and psychopathic killer named Malcolm Wallace, who later shot dead the golf professional, John Douglas Kinzer. When this case came to court, it revealed to the American public how totally corrupt the justice system had become, because LBJ was able to get Wallace off with a five-year suspended sentence. Found guilty of murder one, he walked free that very day. This was the sort of corruption which was running rife through the American political system when Fidel Castro overthrew the right-wing government of Fulgencio Bantista in 1959. Few people are aware that by this advanced stage in their relationship, the CIA and the Mafia were together employing the Giancana tactic of supporting both sides in a war. For many years beforehand, they had been supporting Castro, and not just the Batista regime, as many think, by smuggling in both arms and mercenaries to aid the peasant farmers. One of these mercenaries, an Italian-American called Frank Fiorini, later came to play a pivotal role both in the assassination and subsequent cover-up under his assumed name Frank Sturgis. Sturgis and Castro were photographed together many times during the Cuban Revolution. But after Castro enlisted the help of the Russian Soviets, Sturgis turned against him. Like many in the CIA mafia network, he felt double-crossed when Castro closed the island's casinos and nationalised all Cuban business. He therefore joined forces with men like Bernard Barker, Batista's former secret police chief, and other Cuban expats who had fled en masse to Miami, Florida, and who now sat together on the American mainland as a very disgruntled and highly politicised splinter group. Of course, to the American Nazis, who had bankrolled Hitler, this was intolerable. It was a commercial disaster. Coca-Cola had made millions in easy profits using dirt-cheap Cuban sugar grown by dirt-poor Cuban peasants. They were now being told by an upstart third-world dictator that they would have to pay for sugar at the normal market rate. And the Mafia were losing millions every single day from the loss of illegal gambling. America's Nazi shadow government therefore decided that someone was going to have to mould this loosely knit group of disgruntled anti-Castro Cubans into a crack invasion force to retake the island. Having put their heads together, Dulles and Harriman and Richard Bissell decided this would be an excellent job for Prescott's eldest son, George Herbert Walker Bush a chance for him to prove himself, along with one of his Texas oil business associates, Jack Alston Crichton. Together, these two recruited and trained the Cubans for several terrorist groups known as Operation 40, Alpha 66, ZR Rifle and Operation Mongoose. Renegade bands of merciless assassins who would kill Castro 
and who could later be counted on to eliminate any other third world leaders who dared to interfere with American commercial interests. It was this diverse and unsavoury stream of political intrigue which produced President Kennedy's first great political crisis, the Bay of Pigs, in 1962. By this time, JFK was well aware that the CIA was something much more like a private firm or a family. He wasn't surprised when they invaded Cuba without his permission because he knew they were totally out of control. His antipathy led him to cancel the promised air support and inevitably the invasion failed. The anti-Castro Cubans were mostly captured and Kennedy then tried to add insult to injury by ordering J. Edgar Hoover's FBI to close down the camps where the Cubans were trained. He even allowed Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, to inspect the camps to see they were closed so this could never happen again. Having only just escaped with his life at the Bay of Pigs, it was pretty clear that Frank Sturgis was more than a little annoyed. He was scared because Khrushchev says, don't do this or we're going to do that. You know, so he didn't do it and he deserted the Bay of Pigs. I was involved in the Bay of Pigs. A lot of people, were friends of mine, that were killed in the Bay of Pigs. And I resent that. Don't play political games with me. I'm a military man. I'm a soldier. I go fight. But damn it, if I risk my ass out there and I'm getting shot at, I don't want some stupid ass politician to go ahead and make deals behind my back where my people or maybe myself are going to get killed. I don't like that. This then is how the stage was set for the Kennedy assassination. And when one remembers the colossal number of ruthless and hideously brutal men who had created this situation, it's perhaps a little ironic that a peripheral figure in the cast of characters who actually put the plot together was an attractive young woman. 19-year-old Marita Lorenz's love affair with Fidel Castro and her subsequent recruitment as a CIA assassin by Frank Sturgis to kill him is a very well-known story because it was made into a feature film. In spite of her failure to kill the Cuban leader, Lorenz continued to associate with the assassination squads trained by the CIA, and it was largely her testimony in the Spotlight magazine trial, after a skilful cross-examination by Mark Lane, which gave us a window through which we can now see who really participated in the Kennedy assassination and who was really behind it all. First of all, after the Bay of Pigs invasion, Kennedy had fired Alan Dulles, Richard Bissell and General Charles Cable for essentially using the CIA as their personal hit men after he found out that Robert Mayhew had sought Sam Giancarlo's permission to talk to his underboss, Johnny Roselli, about the possibility of a hit on Fidel Castro. Here you have a government agency funded by the American taxpayer associating with the very organised crime racketeers JFK was trying to put in jail for the purpose of carrying out political murders. The president was incensed. Historians have never been surprised that he vowed to smash the CIA into a thousand pieces. It hardly takes a genius to see why the CIA wanted to kill him. What is more, Jack Alston Crichton and the lifelong friends of Alan Dulles, the Bush family, had just recently purchased exclusive access to 15 million acres of Cuba, almost half the entire island in order to drill for oil. When he came to power, Castro reduced this to a mere 20,000 acres, a colossal investment which now failed and which led to Crichton's CVOVT Oil Exploration Company being delisted from the stock exchange at a loss of $30 million. Crichton and George Bush's friends, the Texas oil billionaires, Clint Murchison and Haroldson Lafayette Hunt, also knew that Kennedy wanted to end their most vital tax break, the oil depletion allowance. And their bosom buddy, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, was standing at this time with one foot in jail and the other on a banana skin due to his involvement in the corruption scandal now breaking around his favourite assistant, Bobby Baker. LBJ knew his life was finished if Kennedy lived, and he would become president himself if Kennedy died. So his involvement in the plot... Is hardly difficult to understand. And even more to this, the heads both of the US military and the military industrial complex which supplied them, exactly the same Nazis who had supported Hitler in World War II, were fully aware that Kennedy wanted to pull out of Vietnam in a move which would have eventually cost them billions 
in lost weapon sales. This circle of thugs and pirates was completed by LBJ's next-door neighbour, J. Edgar Hoover, who had himself invested millions in Clint Murchison's oil business, just like his mafia associate, Vito Genovese. Stepping back to look upon this rogues gallery, it really is remarkable how Kennedy had managed to make an enemy out of every single dirty hood, every corrupt politician and every single Nazi businessman living in the country at that time. It is highly misleading even to see these groups as separate because the truth is that they were all brutal fascists who saw nothing wrong in killing to get their own way. The question now was, how were they going to get him? Because we must never forget that generals, admirals, mafia dons, intelligence chiefs, corrupt politicians and oil billionaires are only people. None of them wanted to go to the electric chair for conspiracy to murder the president. They knew that they had to put together a plan which could not fail to both kill Kennedy and then cover up afterwards the fact that they did it. They knew that in men like Frank Sturgis, his Cuban assassination squads and the Mafia hitmen working with the CIA, they had a huge pool of killers to choose from who were ready, able and willing to do the deed. All the same, how could they possibly get to Kennedy? Because they knew that, at least in Washington, all American presidents are extremely well protected by the Secret Service. The most important first step was to engage the age-old mafia tactic of finding a patsy. To this end, they turned to George de Morenschild, a very sophisticated exiled Russian count and CIA agent who was close friends in the old business with George Bush and the Texas oil men. They were aware that they needed someone like Giuseppe Zangara, who appeared to be a low-life, discontented misfit. So they chose a low-level CIA operative, who had been groomed precisely in order to appear to be a low-life, discontented misfit, and Ali Harvey Oswald, who was carefully handled by de Morinchild as he was placed like a chess piece in the Texas School Book Depository. With the patsy selected, the combined heads of the American Nazis now sat down together to discuss their problem. How do you kill a man? Riding in an open car on a public street in front of hordes of people without being seen. And then, how do you cover up forever afterwards the fact that this was a conspiracy and not the work of a lone nut? The plotters were keenly aware that it was the second question which posed the biggest problem. The professional military men like Colonel Ed Lansdale and Admiral George Berkeley, Kennedy's personal physician, were well aware that there are any number of ways to hide or disguise a sniper behind trees, inside other vehicles, behind windows in office buildings. But this was a plot which had to have an absolute guarantee of success. If a squad of riflemen were all to fire at their target at the same time, this would certainly guarantee the man's death. But the subsequent police investigation would instantly realise more than one shooter was involved. A team of gunmen all firing together might actually blow Kennedy's head clean off. A single sniper couldn't do that. So what were they to do? It was during these deliberations that a macabre thought first registered. They would have to control the body after the shooting in order to make sure that all physical evidence available to police forensic scientists conform to the scenario of a single assassin. And just how in the hell were they going to do that? By way of preparing the ground, Sam Giancana now ordered Richard Nixon's political associate Jack Ruby to keep Oswald snug under his wing and then to set about hiring the best local riflemen, preferred candidates being men like his close friend Charles Void Harrelson the father of Hollywood actor Woody Harrelson, who had proven his hitman credentials by shooting dead dozens of men for money. He then turned to his Mafia associates, Carlos Marcello and Santos Traficante, to supply the best gunmen from their cities while he himself instructed the well-known underboss Tony Accardo to give the Chicago end of the contract to Giancana's favourite and most trusted hoodlums, Charles Nicoletti and Milwaukee Phil Aldericio. This pair had to be flown in 1,500 miles to the ranch of Mafiahood 
Peter Le Carvele, and then driven the remaining 600 miles to Dallas. It had been agreed with Giancarna's and Genovese's oil business partners, H.L. Hunt and Clint Murchison, that every gunman would be paid $50,000 for the hit, and that the oil men would stump up the cash, so there was no way of tracing it back to either the mob or the CIA. For their part, Jack Crichton and George Bush were trying to lay the groundwork at the street level with the mayor, Earl Cable, the brother of CIA chief Charles Cable, whom Kennedy had fired. Both the Cable brothers were crucially important in the development of the fine details of the plot because they agreed to allow Crichton and his associates, George Lumpkin, the Dallas police chief, Lieutenant Colonel George Whitmire and Harry Weatherford, to make use of their 488th Military Intelligence Detachment, a privately funded part-time intelligence force which had amongst its ranks many members of the John Birch Society, the Ku Klux Klan, and around half of all the serving police officers in Dallas. The plotters realised this was a masterstroke, because it meant they could control the streets and the crime scene, but they also realised that when the shooting occurred, the response of at least half the police on duty would appear to be completely genuine. And yet for all this intricate planning, involving, as Sam Giancana later admitted, dozens of men, the American Nazis were aware they still had a problem. Getting the snipers into position and coordinating their fire by radio was not too difficult. It's something the military do every day. But this problem of blowing the man's head clean off had another side to it. Supposing, as can happen, all the snipers missed. How could they possibly legislate for this contingency? You see, being a professional sniper is a lot like being a professional golfer. Everyone knows that, generally speaking, a golf pro on a par 3 will hit the green. But even the world's best occasionally miss by a wide margin, and the same can happen to any rifleman. We can be quite certain that the guiding brains of the American Nazis, Alan Dulles and David Attlee Phillips, in order to cover this eventuality, must have at least considered having one assassin run up to the limousine to attempt a point-blank range mafia-style shooting should the others miss. But then another problem appeared. Supposing their assassin couldn't run quick enough to jump on a speeding car. Little by little, the realisation hit home. The plot could even wind up looking silly and themselves ridiculous. There was only one answer. They would have to control the President's protection, the Secret Service. Marita Lorenz testified under oath that in late November of 1963 she drove from Miami to Dallas, Texas with Frank Sturgis, followed by a backup car which contained a stash of weapons. Travelling along with them were Jerry Patrick Hemming, an American mercenary like Sturgis. Were you ever offered money to assassinate President Kennedy? Directly. On numerous occasions. Two Cuban brothers, Ignacio and Guillermo Novo Sampol, a Cuban pilot called Pedro Diaz Lanz, and his friend, Orlando Bosch. At first, Marita assumed this was to be just another armed smuggling engagement, just like many others she'd been on with Sturgis before. However, when they reached their Dallas motel, they were visited by someone Marita had met many times before, CIA agent E. Howard Hunt, who stayed almost an hour and paid Sturgis with cash stuffed in a very large envelope. This was the evening of November 21st, 1963, and Marita began to get worried. She knew that President Kennedy was visiting Dallas the next day. Becoming concerned, she pressed Sturgis as to the real purpose of the visit, and when he told her that for this one time it had to be confidential, she decided she wanted out. Marita had no way of knowing that a great number of other people had made similar journeys that day. CIA pilot Tosh Plumley flew several assassins into Dallas Love Field without even being told who they were. From all over the country, radio operators, riflemen, drivers, false ID suppliers like Chauncey Holt and Bernard Barker, and getaway pilots like David Ferry, converged on the city. Whilst at the home of oilman Clint Murchison, 
a group of his Nazi friends were congregating to celebrate Kennedy's imminent demise. Due to the testimony of LBJ's mistress, Madeleine Duncan Brown, the mother of his illegitimate son, we now know that amongst these guests were J. Edgar Hoover and his homosexual lover, Clyde Tolson, who stood to lose the millions they'd invested in their host's oil business if Kennedy lived. Hoover also knew Kennedy wanted to replace him as head of the FBI. The two Brown brothers of Brown Brothers Harriman, who along with Cliff Carter, John Connolly and Senator Joseph Yarborough stood to lose millions from lost defence contracts because they knew JFK wanted to end the Vietnam War. Also present were Joseph Sevilla, head of the Mafia in Dallas, and the mayor of Dallas, Earl Cable, the CIA men who knew the president was serious about smashing the Central Intelligence Agency because he'd already fired Cable's brother, Charles. Having a drink with them, was Chase Manhattan Bank chief John McCloy, a confirmed Nazi who had shared a box with Hitler at the 1936 Berlin Olympic Games, and Mafia chieftain Carlos Marcello, who felt nicely at home rubbing shoulders with Sam Giancarna's representatives Jack Ruby, Richard Nixon, and Haraldson Lafayette Hunt. The media were represented by Eamon G. Carter, and the only one who might have felt a little out of place as he awaited his boss was the world-class marksman and serial killer Malcolm Wallace. Late in the evening, Lyndon Baines Johnson finally turned up and briefly went into the party. When he came out to greet Madeleine Brown, she said he was euphoric. Let's go back to the night before. When, when Johnson came out of the meeting, uh, what did he say to you? He was so angry. He had a violent temper when he was upset. Well, let's use the, the exact words that he said to you. What did he say he, to you? He, uh, he grabbed me by the arm and he had this deep voice and he said, after tomorrow those SOBs will never embarrass me again. That's no threat. That's a promise. Johnson had clearly been told by the people in that room that everything was ready. The next morning, the president landed at Love Field and was led to his car by Governor John Connolly. As he is driven away, it is immediately apparent that something is wrong. A Secret Service agent, Henry J. Rickber, tries to take up his proper position on the president's limousine, holding on to these handles provided for the purpose, and is ordered to stand down by Emery Roberts. Let's just look at Rickber's reaction again. He is quite clearly disgusted. Why aren't they letting him do his job? And as the car glides into Dallas, we can now see how the removal of his Secret Service protection has opened the President up to a field of fire from almost any direction. It's plain from these pictures that as the motorcade moved on into Dallas, the Secret Service meant to protect the President remained crowded together on the vehicle behind. While travelling in the pilot car some 400 yards ahead, three men are smiling as they see everything is going to plan. Crichton, Lumpkin and Whitmire have used their influence to remove the military protection which should have been amongst the crowd. And whilst the people lining the parade route are ten deep in places, Lumpkin has seen to it that the police have let almost no one into the would-be crime scene. Pausing at the corner of Houston and Elm, Lumpkin is seen exchanging reassurances with one of his men. Yes, he tells him. The hit is on. Glancing discreetly upwards, he sees Weatherford and the best Cuban sniper, Eladio del Valle, preparing to fire. The signal is passed to the other snipers to get into position. Having been let into the Daltex building by oil baron Haraldson Hunt, Eugene Hale Brading unlocks the second floor broom closet. A client of New Orleans lawyer G. Ray Gill, who also represents Mafia boss Carlos Mocello, Brading has a getaway pilot waiting, whom Gill employs as a private detective, David Ferry. He opens the window, and as Charles Nicoletti loads his rifle, Richard Kane listens to his radio. Car coming. 
Get ready. Closing the door, Milwaukee Phil Aldricio guards the corridor with two Cubans, Rolando Mesferrer and Rolando Otero. This basic pattern was established all over the plaza. A sniper next to a radio man, alongside a second marksman who could take over should the first want to back out at the last moment. Each team was then guarded by more assassins, mainly Cubans, who made sure no one interfered with each group. It all sounds quite professional, and the truth is, it was. Sam Giancana's spy in the Chicago police force, Richard Kane, was an electronics and wiretapping expert who spoke five languages. Up on the grassy knoll, with his childhood friend Charles Harrison, stood the diminutive Charles Frederick Rogers, a nuclear physicist who worked in seismology for Shell Oil. He was also friends with David Ferry and the Civil Air Patrol. Up in the Texas School Book Depository, LBJ's psychotic hitman Malcolm Wallace held a PhD and taught at the University of Texas. The Texas oilmen, mafia dons, merchant bankers and military industrialists had assembled the all-time dream team of professional killers. They were there to make absolutely certain their king died and the two men who in later years would steal his crown Richard Milhouse Nixon and George Herbert Walker Bush smiled from the sidewalk as they exchanged winks with Jack Crichton. There was no way Kennedy could escape now, and they knew it. Arranging his sniper's nest at the other end of the sixth floor, Sturgis was the first to be spotted by Arnold Rowland. I was just looking around and when you noticed a man up in the window and I remarked to my wife, tried to point him out, and remarked that he must be a security guard, secret service agent. Well, the window then that you're referring to is on the opposite uh, end of the building from uh, where the main entrance to the building is. Yes, it is on the other side of the building. And he had a rifle. It looked like a high-powered rifle because it had a scope which looked in relation to the size of the rifle to be a big scope. A moment later, 15-year-old Amos Ewins caught sight of one of the Sturgis-trained Cubans, Ignacio Novo Sampol. Even more significantly, Richard Randolph Carr, a steel construction worker who was looking for a job in the new Dallas courthouse, which was then under construction, stared out from his seventh-floor vantage point and saw Malcolm Wallace taking position to fire. Testifying at the trial of Clay Shaw, he gave a minutely detailed description of a very heavy-set man in a sports jacket who wore large framed glasses. He could see the man so clearly, he even said his eyeglasses had large ear pieces. America, the home of the brave and the land of the free, was about to discover that it wasn't what it thought it was. As the president's car made the turn onto Houston, government agents who had sworn an oath to uphold their country's democratic principles waited alongside mafia killers to murder their own commander-in-chief. One of the men they were working for, Sam Giancana, said this proved that in reality there was no such thing as white hats and black hats. That notion, he said, was just a sham for saps to cling to. The one thing I recognized was there are no black hats and there are no white hats. They all conduct themselves the exact same. And very good evidence of that is that the CIA would hire two so-called mafia men, Sam Giancana and John Roselli, to assassinate Fidel Castro. Um, if there's such a difference, you're not supposed to have anything to do with each other. But in, in essence, the remark is, really, they're all in bed together. They all do business together. It was now that Abraham Zabruder pressed the trigger on his 8mm cine camera. Ever since that moment, the world has accepted that what he recorded was the definitive account of what really happened. What people must appreciate 
is that what they have just seen is not at all what really happened. Had you actually been there on the day, this is what you would have seen. And doesn't that look a great deal more suspicious? So just exactly what did happen during the 10 seconds that Bruder was filming. To begin with, Dulles, Lansdale and Atley Phillips had tried to get over the problem of volley fire, blowing the president's head clean off by firing in four stages. Stage one was meant to be a single shot by Charles Nicoletti into the back of Kennedy's head from the Daltex building some 40 yards behind. Had he succeeded, the plotters would have had the single assassin with one bullet story they wanted. But in his excitement, the Mafia assassin squeezed the trigger too soon. His bullet ricocheted off the hard chrome sill of the limo's back seat and struck the curb beneath the overpass, sending up a sharp piece of concrete which scratched James Tague's face. Watch again. We clearly see how this little girl stops running and her gaze looks directly at where the shot originated and not up at the sixth floor of the depository. It was now that Umbrella Man took over. Standing right at the curbside, it was his job, should the first shot miss, to give a clear visual signal. Target is not injured. The intelligence chiefs knew that if this situation occurred, Kennedy would now be moving rapidly away from the first sniper. They knew the only way to make sure of getting him was to fusillade the car. So a moment later, two rifles tried to fire from directly in front at exactly the same time to deceive witnesses into thinking there was only one shot. You said you'd killed President Kennedy. At the same time I said I had killed the judge, I said I had killed Kennedy. Well, do you believe Lee Harvey Oswald killed President Kennedy? We'll get back to that. Alone, without any aid from a rogue... Um, agency of the U.S. government, or at least a, a portion of that agency. I believe you're very naive if you do. Harrelson's bullet hit JFK in the throat, and another gunman, hiding in a culvert 50 yards away, up in the embankment of the overpass, made the hole in the windscreen, which was later seen by Dr. Evalier Glanges. The presidential limousine was there. Had been staying there for some time, just watching the back of the emergency room talked to my friend next to me and said, look, there's a bullet hole in the windshield, and pointed it out to them. But it was very clear, it was a through and through bullet hole through the windshield of the car, from the front to the back. As Kennedy emerges from behind the road sign, his distress is clear, while Governor Connolly remains composed. This single frame of the Zabruder film makes nonsense of the single bullet theory because it's quite clear both men have not been struck at the same time. Kennedy has now passed through two layers of fire and has not been hit in the head. To cover this eventuality, the assassins were given a simple instruction. Fusillade the car with everything. So that in the next few moments, the five remaining riflemen fired, causing the Secret Service agent riding in the front passenger seat, Roy Kellerman, to report a feeling like a jet sonic boom as the hail of bullets whistled into the car. It is now more than three seconds after Kennedy is hit in the throat that Frank Sturgis misses his target altogether and blows out five inches of Governor Connolly's ribs, compressing his lungs and puffing his cheeks. With a bullet which quite clearly struck at far too steep an angle to come from the other end of the depository. In almost the same instant, Eladio Del Valle hit the governor in the wrist, Weatherford fired into his thigh, and Nicoletti's second shot hit the chrome frame of the window. A moment later, the best marksman, Malcolm Wallace, shot Kennedy in his upper back, the bullet strike witnessed and recorded by all the Secret Service men in the following car. 
Jackie Kennedy starts looking concerned, and yet even now there are no obvious signs that her husband, held upright by his back brace, has been shot twice. The assassins have so far failed to hit him in the head, and it is now that they play the ace up their sleeve. Here we can finally answer the riddle of where on an empty street you can hide a man with a rifle, and how he can manage to shoot a man speeding past him in a limousine. The answer is that he can't, and that is why the driver, William Greer, looked around twice to see whether Kennedy had been hit in the head, and when he saw he hadn't, as dozens of witnesses, including police officers, confirmed, he stopped the car completely. His orders was to slow down where the rest of the guys... This is Greer, the, the driver of the presidential limousine. Yeah, presidential yeah. limousine, yeah. slow down almost to stop. It is now that most people have been led to believe that Kennedy was shot in the head by Charles Void Harrelson, the sniper standing on the grassy knoll. This is not true. Because if we look at the angle of elevation of a shot from that area, it's obvious that a shot originating from above and right would have pushed Kennedy's head down and left. Whereas it's quite clear that his head is knocked upwards and to the left by the impact. So where did that bullet come from? Incredibly, the answer has lain hidden in the most well-known and iconic image from the assassination of the motorcycle policeman heaving his bike onto its stand. Look now as we freeze frame him here. This is the moment when the whole world was looking up the hill toward the man who had fired from the grassy knoll, but that is not where the police officer is looking. He is looking down into the storm drain because that is where that shot at a stationary car came from. The shot which all of the well-known assassination witnesses described as coming from behind the picket fence missed completely and ripped up the grass at Jean Hill's feet. She did not even notice, but we know this is true because the FBI told her so. So who were the men who fired unseen from the storm drains on Elm Street? One thing we know is that they were very young and had to be brought into the conspiracy because they had to crawl into a filthy, smelly sewer, something which the older, experienced mafia assassins would never have dreamed of doing. They were basically two kids, looking for excitement. The first was Curtis Laverne Crayford, also known as Larry Crayford. Formerly CIA, he had worked for Ruby at the Carousel Club, and Ruby had told everyone his name was Lee Harvey Oswald, until Lee Harvey Oswald walked in. But while above ground... The world was taking pictures and running and screaming and trying to figure out what had happened. The other young man was stumbling along 400 yards of a reeking, fetid Dallas sewer pipe to emerge from this culvert. And he was not Lee Harvey Oswald or Roscoe White or J.D. Tippett nor even a Cuban or Russian communist. His name was Jack Allen Lawrence. And we know that after stumbling up this bank, he turned up 15 minutes later at the Lincoln Mercury car showroom, where he'd obtained a job with false references, pale, sweating, and, on a hot, sunny day in Dallas, covered in mud. Telling his co-workers, Albert Bogard and Robert Tater, he had been ill that morning, he stumbled into the men's room and threw up, while they, feeling his behaviour was suspicious, called the police who made a record of the entire incident. Back at the plaza, the guilt of the radio men coordinating the gunfire can be seen from their behaviour. These two, Orlando Bosch and the Umbrella Man, have a seat while everyone else runs around them. Bosch makes a report that the hit was successful, then casually walks away, just like the chief radio coordinator, Jim Hicks with the radios clearly visible in their back pockets. A few yards away, the CIA's clean-up squad have begun working to remove all evidence useful to a forensic team. Deputy Sheriff Buddy Walthers is here seen finding the bullet which struck in the grass near the manhole cover. He hands it on to one of the fake FBI men, who pockets it. While this is going on, Rogers, 
Harrelson, and E. Howard Hunt are discovered hiding in the boxcars of the train which they hoped would be their getaway vehicle. Until it's prevented from moving by railway dispatcher and key witness Lee Bowers. They are photographed repeatedly as they are marched to the Dallas courthouse. And we can clearly see in this picture the radio receiver Hunt is wearing in his right ear, which is identical to the receivers worn by those Dallas police officers who were part of the plot. As they walk, they are overseen by Colonel Ed Lansdale, who secures their release and begins to give the press the cover story that this man is the major suspect and that acting alone he shot the president from behind. The truth, as we now know, is that eight separate snipers firing 16 shots in four separate stages had tried to make certain of killing the president by hitting him in the head and had failed abysmally. The shooting on the day had been nothing to write home about. A third of all the shots had missed the car completely. Had it not been for the ruse of bribing the driver to break at a point painted on the curbside, which is still visible, so that Jack Lawrence could shoot Kennedy in the head from just 15 feet away, the president might have survived. So now we must address the question, why does the Zabruder film not show this very obvious setup of the limousine stopping for the headshot? The answer, of course, is that it has been tampered with. In the 1960s, Hollywood special effects teams had developed techniques for masking off segments of film frames to disguise the true movement of figures within the picture. In the Zabruder film, frames have been removed in order to fake a continuous flowing motion so that we don't see the very obvious setup which dozens of witnesses reported. If you look now at the top of the frame, the doctoring of the film becomes perfectly obvious in the way in which the figures are blurred and yet the shadows are sharp, which is impossible. This CIA tampering with the evidence becomes even clearer when the Zabruder film is run next to the Orville Nix film taken from the other side. It's easy to see from the way the motorcycles suddenly close on the limousine, that it stops completely. And we can see that frames have also been removed from the next film by the way in which Agent Clint Hill appears to move sideways while running forwards, before leaping on the car. As the mad dash to Parkland Hospital begins, the chief coordinator in the assassination plot, George Herbert Walker Bush, casually relaxes with hands in his pockets, at the entrance of the school book depository. Now this is going to be one of those all too familiar Kennedy assassination moments in which people will say, well, yes, it could be him, but how can we be sure? Because we've seen this kind of thing before with Badgeman. However, a gentleman who I think must be a police detective has posted a YouTube video in which he utilizes the latest forensic techniques for identifying murder suspects by making a comparison between the photo taken in Dealey Plaza and one of George Bush in conversation with Richard Nixon during Watergate. This man points out that this person has exactly the same skull shape, exactly the same hairline, chin and nose as George Bush. He is also wearing the same type of suit white shirt and exactly the same type of tie. He is exactly the same height, the same weight, is wearing clothing which matches down to his shoes, but most importantly, he has a characteristic mannerism of cocking his right wrist when he puts his hands in his pockets. We know from this declassified FBI memo that George Bush was in Dallas, staying at the Sheraton, on November 22nd. So can there be any doubt about this person's identity? Surrounded by the corrupt policemen he was coordinating, Bush knew already that if an honest officer should happen to catch one of the assassins, it would, because of what Mark Lane rightly calls plausible deniability, make no difference. Because what would they find? Mafia hoods with prison records as long as their arms? or contract killers like Charles Harrelson? They certainly wouldn't have found anyone who carried CIA credentials or anyone whose involvement with the government could be traced. 
But even while he smiled and chatted to his fellow killers, Bush was unaware that the plotters had just made their first big mistake. They knew that they had to forensically control the body from the moment the shots were fired, and the moment Kennedy entered Trauma Room 1, that control had to be relinquished. Although they had CIA agents placed in the emergency unit, these people were not aware of the throat wound, which could hardly be seen because it was so tiny. It was at this moment that all the Dallas doctors and nurses like Aubrey Bell made a mental note of this very obvious sign of a frontal entry shot. One of the Dallas medical team, Dr. Charles Crenshaw, a junior doctor at that time, vividly recalls what the first professionals in the Kennedy killing had to deal with. The second wound was here in the throat, right above the necktie. It was a small opening, very small, three to five millimeters, about the size of your little finger. I looked at the wound again. I wanted to know and remember this the rest of my life. And the rest of my life, I will always know he was shot from the front. And also described the portion missing from the rear of Kennedy's head after the impact of the frangible bullet, which hit him in the right temple. The bullet struck about where and passed about where? From here right. through. And taking out the... The back or the occipital part. The back of your head. This was gone. At approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time today, here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound. This information in soon made its way to the media. And this is why, at the very first press conference, Press Secretary Malcolm Kilduff correctly described the cause of death and direction of the shot. In order to find a means with which to contradict this evidence, the cover-up now began in earnest, with the summoning from the Restland Funeral Home of a CIA agent who was known for being the best in the business at reconstructive surgery on cadavers, John Melvin Liggett. This man was actually attending a funeral when he was told of the president's assassination and asked to go to Parkland by the coroner. What he didn't know as he drove away was that one of his clients in this macabre and gruesome story was at that moment still alive. When he was arrested years later by New York police detective Jim Rothstein, Frank Sturgis, on discovering that Rothstein was a Bay of Pigs veteran like himself, got into an old army buddy's conversation with him and said first of all that after the assassination he returned to the Miami safe house where he ridiculed Marita Lorenz for missing history. It was all perfectly safe, he told her. No cops, no newspaper investigation. Everything was covered. I asked Sturgis, Jesus Christ, Frank, did you shoot the president? Did you have something to do with that? He said, ah, who gives a shit? Yeah, who's going to prove it? He said, we kill a lot of people. What the hell's the difference? Sturgis then went on to say that Dallas police officer J.D. Tibbet was actually gunned down by the radio talk show host G. Gordon Liddy, who was at that time a CIA agent working with E. Howard Hunt. And here we must address a question which puzzled assassination researchers for years. Why did a Dallas policeman have to die within a few minutes of President Kennedy? What possible function could he have played in the overall plot as a corpse? One would think the authorities could have caught the fleeing Patsy without any need to incriminate him any further. So why did the life of J.D. Tibbet also have to end on the 22nd of November 1963? Where did he fit in? In only the last few years, a wonderful investigator called Robert D. Morningstar discovered one tiny little fact about Jefferson Davis Tibbet, which became the most important single piece in the completion of this puzzle. Because Officer Tibbet had a nickname. When he was at work, his fellow officers always used to call him JFK, because at 39 years of age, he looked exactly like him.
In the only well-known picture of Tippett, his Elvis haircut makes him appear very youthful. But having turned grey and having nearly turned 40, most people felt his resemblance to Kennedy was uncanny. What Tippett never knew, as he drove past assassination witnesses Jack Tatum, Domingo Benavides and Aquila Clemens, was that he had been selected to play the role of the president in death. Researchers have always believed it couldn't be a coincidence that Tippett was shot in the right temple, just like JFK some 45 minutes earlier. They wondered why bullets had been removed from his body in the ambulance, and why, when he was pronounced dead on arrival at the Methodist Hospital, it was felt necessary to move his body to Parkland. With their concentration firmly fixed on the casket of the deceased president, the newsmen completely ignored the ambulance which spirited away the body of J.D. Tibbet so that it could be loaded onto Air Force Two, where John Melvin Liggett was waiting. When Kennedy's casket arrived at Love Field a few minutes later, Clint Hill, the agent who jumped on the car, recalled that all the people aboard Air Force One were told they had to go forward to witness the swearing-in of Lyndon Baines Johnson. This, of course, was just a ruse, to get Jackie Kennedy to leave her husband's body, and the moment she was out of the way, his cadaver was stolen and placed aboard Air Force Two, next to the cadaver of J.D. Tibbet. Many people have seen this famous picture, in which LBJ is smiling at Congressman Albert Thomas, a moment after becoming president, and he is winking back. We haven't known until now just how huge and terrible a secret he was sharing with Johnson, because at that moment, on the plane right alongside the most highly qualified specialist in reconstructive surgery and embalming in the country, John Melvin Liggett, was starting to make a facsimile of the dead president, using the body of J.D. Tibbet, in order to obscure the true extent of the damage to Kennedy's head and make it seem consistent with a shot from behind. But Liggett realised immediately this was well-nigh impossible because having been told over the radio about the head shot, Liddy took it upon himself to try and ape this damage by firing into Tippett's torso and then, when he was down, firing into his right temple, instead of into the back of the head as he'd been instructed. This was a second huge mistake. The human brain has a consistency like play school plasticine. Fire a bullet through it and it is very easy for a skilled pathologist to track the bullet's path at autopsy. What Liggett wanted to show to any investigators was a brain that looked like this. What he had was one brain which looked like this, and another which looked like this. A large portion of Kennedy's brain had been ripped out by the impact of the explosive or frangible bullet and what remained was filled with tiny shards of lead, some of them microscopic, which might take all night to locate. Liggett was terrified. The plotters had asked him to play Dr. Frankenstein at 30,000 feet. Yet with all his embalming experience, he instantly realised a botched job was the best he could possibly deliver. In his panic, he sawed off Tippett's skull, and simply ripped out the entire brain to at least make sure no one could track the bullet which, after Liddy's error, had so obviously come from the wrong direction. He then compounded Liddy's error by making a large hole in the rear of the head to ape the damage to Kennedy's head. With this done, he rebuilt the skull, hurriedly sewed the scalp back together, and then set about the gruesome task of trying to make the cadaver of J.D. Tibbet more closely resemble the cadaver of John F. Kennedy. By shaving eyebrows, bringing forward Tippett's slightly more receding hairline, filling in missing segments of both heads with plaster of Paris, and rebuilding portions of the flesh with wax. Liggett performed this ghoulish service while the aircraft he was on, Air Force Two, went through the usual procedure of leapfrogging Air Force One to arrive at Andrews Air Force Base slightly earlier. He wasn't given long enough, and in the rush to get finished, the plotters now made their third and most stupid mistake. Instead of placing Tippett's body 
in a casket identical to the one aboard Air Force One. They placed him in a Spartan grey metal coffin inside a body bag. As the TV media showed these distressing pictures to a world reeling in shock, it's hardly surprising that no one ever dreamed this casket could be empty, but it was. As it was driven away, out of sight of the media, the two bodies were taken from Air Force Two and loaded onto a helicopter. It was at this point that the two honest men, FBI agents Francis X. O'Neill and his partner, William Siebert, became crucial figures in the story. They explained to researcher David Lifton that they made the journey to the Naval Hospital at Bethesda in the car behind the hearse which carried Jackie and Bobby and most notably Admiral George Berkeley who made sure he stayed with the empty coffin by sitting on another man's lap. Upon reaching Bethesda, Seabird and O'Neill said Berkeley then guided the family members into the building while the hearse was ordered to the rear to unload. But that was where the simplicity ended. The FBI men and many other witnesses recalled a scene of absolute mayhem in which no one seemed to know what was going on, and military men were rushing around everywhere exchanging anecdotes about decoy ambulances they had been ordered to follow, which had become high-speed chases around the hospital grounds as these vehicles raced away. It seems this confusion was created with the intention of misleading both the press and the large respectful crowd which had gathered on the lawn. People were asking each other which ambulance contained the President's body. Then a rumour started that it was coming by helicopter, but which one? Everyone watching that night recalls the air was filled with them, and the FBI men also told Lifton that in the midst of all this mayhem, they helped to carry the casket inside. This was flatly denied by the team of Navy men who said they did it alone. It is therefore perfectly clear that two bodies were brought to the morgue separately whilst confusion reigned. And it was now that the plotters themselves became confused by the mayhem they had created because they left J.D. Tibbet's cadaver in the wrong casket. It should have been switched and gone into the autopsy room in the large expensive casket used in Dallas. I helped put President Kennedy's body in a bronze ceremonial casket on November 22, 1963 at Parker Memorial Hospital. Instead, mortuary technician Paul O'Connor received a coffin so dull and nondescript no one could believe it had been utilised to transport the body of a president. It was a very plain casket, and when I say plain, I mean it was a pinkish grey. It had pink and grey uh, on the sides. Uh, there was nothing fancy about it as far as being bronze. Uh, it wasn't bronze. The autopsy then became a farce the moment it began. While Siebert and O'Neill made their now famous and entirely correct observation, that the body seemed to have undergone surgery prior to autopsy, mainly in the head area, Commander Humes himself testified that the moment he touched the head, pieces of the skull fell down onto the autopsy table. That is not possible, unless surgery was done before post-mortem. And that surgery could only have been performed aboard the aircraft because there was no other time to do it. Humes then found that he had to try to work with Admirals Berkeley, Galloway and Kenny actually touching his elbows and became increasingly confused and embarrassed himself at his utter failure to find any trace of the bullets which killed the President. Of course, this was hardly surprising, considering the President lay dead in an adjoining room and that Liggett had removed all the bullets from J.D. Tibbet. As the autopsy proceeded, O'Connor revealed that Berkeley interfered constantly in the procedure, steering Humes away from the torso, where he would have found the holes made by Liddy. And while everyone in the room remained aghast and disturbed by the huge hole in the back of the head and absence of any brain matter, two porters O'Connor had never seen before came in pushing a trolley, which had a sheet on it which hid a small lump. They had told people in the corridor it was a dead newborn baby, but it turned out to be a complete brain, which could only have come from a third cadaver. This was weighed and pickled in formaldehyde before anyone even had a chance to inquire when it had been removed. 
The most farcical moment of all came when Humes faced Arlen Specter in front of the Warren Commission and found the leading counsel pressing him to say that the wound he found in the back of the head was an entry wound. His incredible answer was that the bullet could only have entered and exited from the rear. Humes actually told the world that the bullet had done a U-turn inside the President's skull. Now that we know the truth, it may seem remarkable that David Lifton got so close and yet never quite realised that what he had been investigating for 15 years was a body switch. But can we really be surprised? Like so many other decent men, Lifton was simply unable to imagine that anyone could ever think up such a grotesque and degenerate conspiracy. He simply never realised that what he was dealing with was nothing less than the devil himself. And for those who find all this impossible to accept, one of the devils who murdered JFK, Frank Sturgis, was perfectly candid about how routine body switches had become in the CIA by 1963. There was a switch. A body switch. A body switch, yes. The truth about the autopsy is that the devils who killed Kennedy messed up very badly. They had wanted to show the world actual photographs of a single bullet wound from behind. As it was, they had to resort to a lot of badly faked photographs which critics like Robert Grodin easily discredited and silly drawings which everyone realised did not line up anywhere near the school book depository. With the autopsy over, Mrs Kennedy and the President's brother were shown the body prepared for burial. Not surprisingly, they were wholly unconvinced by Leggett's attempts to make a Dallas police officer look like the President of the United States. Witnesses there at the time said Bobby scoffed and said, it doesn't look anything like him. While Mrs. Kennedy became adamant, it isn't Jack, she declared. That looks like something you'd find in Madame Tussaud's wax museum. Many people have studied this alleged picture of the President's remains and wondered how it could possibly be John F. Kennedy when the Zabruder film clearly shows this right temple area being blown apart by the impact of the frangible bullet. The simple answer is that this is not JFK. It's the corpse of Officer J.D. Tibbet, surgically altered to look like the President. On arriving home, Liggett was informed the plot was in serious trouble. His wife Lois told how he staggered in the door, unkempt, dishevelled and quite obviously exhausted, which was very out of character for a man who took pride in always being neat, tidy and organised. It was about 24 hours before I heard from him. He came home and he walked in the door and when I saw him, he physically looked like he had really been through a very traumatic experience. His clothes were disarrayed, and that was so out of character for him. And he said, we're going to get out of town for a while until all of this blows over. And that was a quote, because I thought, well, what blows over? Minutes later, they were speeding down the highway towards Corpus Christi, utterly bewildered as to what on earth was going on. Chain-smoking at the wheel, Liggett was looking increasingly nervous. It wasn't just that his botched reconstruction had failed to convince and would lead to courtroom testimony of bullets doing U-turns inside the President's head. The problem was that the patsy was still alive. Deputy Sheriff Roger Craig told investigators it was plain to him that Lee Harvey Oswald was not meant to survive his arrest procedure. He said that when he arrived at the Texas Theatre, a group of his fellow officers were waiting at the rear, guns drawn, and that it was quite obvious that Oswald was meant to make a break out the back door where he would run into a hail of gunfire. However, Oswald himself was an intelligence agent, and once he realised he had been chosen as the fall guy, he briefly prolonged his existence by loudly yelling so that all the witnesses present could hear, I am not resisting arrest, I am not resisting arrest. This is why Liggett, like all the others involved in the plot, was shaking in his boots on November 23rd. 
They were all aware that a sharp lawyer could get Oswald released simply by discovering that the chain of evidence had been broken in relation to Kennedy's remains. Once free to talk, and with intimate knowledge of the major players in the assassination plot, he could have gotten the heads of the FBI and CIA, all the military chiefs of staff, the mafia chieftains and the Dallas oil men all thrown in jail together for murder. Many people have wondered how the plotters could be so unbelievably dumb and so unbelievably obvious as to have Oswald murdered live on national television. The simple truth was that they had absolutely no choice. Their botched assassination attempt had proved that they were not as smart as they thought they were. The actual shooting had gone very badly. Most of the shots had missed. They'd had to botch the autopsy and now they were having to botch the silencing of the patsy. Lois Liggett recalled that the moment Ruby fired, the atmosphere in their motel room evaporated. The minute he saw that, he looked at me and said, everything's okay now, and you could just see his face. He was like all the pressure had been taken off of him. All of a sudden he was like, sigh of relief, let's go, we can go home now. It was basically, pack your things, come on, we're leaving, you know, now we can go. The family turned around and went straight back home to discover that Mr Liggett now enjoyed a new vocation. It appeared he had suddenly come into millions, which bought his family a big new house and himself a new lifestyle, which included many wild poker parties at which, among others, he hosted David Ferry. This was not Lois Liggett's scene. She divorced him, heard that not long afterwards he was arrested for murder, and then shot dead while trying to escape. But this was not the end of Liggett's story. His new wife told Lois that the man she buried could not have been John Melvin Liggett, because the corpse she was shown had a moustache and he couldn't grow one. Then many years later, Lois Liggett actually saw her deceased ex-husband in a casino while on a trip to Las Vegas. Quite clearly, this man had been the beneficiary of yet another CIA body switch, and to this day, doubts remain as to the true fate of Jack Ruby, Lee Oswald, John Liggett and the President himself. Many researchers now believe the plotters may have kept Kennedy's remains as a souvenir and buried J.D. Tibbet in Arlington Cemetery. All added together, the pilots, spotters, radio men, mafia assassins, embalmers, physicians and corrupt agents from the FBI, CIA and Dallas police had cost the American Nazis $25 million, approximately $2 billion in today's money. But they could afford it. In the years that followed, they cynically kept the war in Vietnam going by putting in just enough troops so that the line never moved forward or back. And while the American fat cats grew fatter on military industrial contracts, their mafia friends used the CIA's complete immunity to smuggle trillions of dollars worth of cocaine and heroin around the world. Sir, uh, the Republicans are trying to blame you for the existence of a small air base at Mena, Arkansas. This base was set up by George Bush and Oliver North and uh, the CIA to help the Iran Contras, and they brought in plane load after plane load of cocaine there for sale in the United States, and then they took the money and bought weapons and took them back to the Contras, all of which was illegal, as you know, under the Bolin Act. But tell me, did they tell you that this had to be in existence because of national security? Well, let me answer the question. No, they didn't tell me anything about it. Of course, when criminals are making easy money, they tend to become lazy and careless, and this is what led to Watergate. Someone's here. Please. 
jacket. When the two plainclothes police officers switch the lights on in the Watergate building, who should they find hiding there? Frank Sturgis and Bernard Barker, who were working for E. Howard Hunt, exactly the same people who had murdered President Kennedy nine years earlier. Sturgis even told the San Francisco Chronicle that the true reason for their burglary of the Watergate offices was to retrieve compromising pictures of CIA men in Dealey Plaza, which the Democrats were going to have published. Of course, somebody had to take a fall for conducting such a woefully sloppy operation, and when Howard Hunt found himself in prison for 33 months, he rather turned against his old friends for making him into the patsy on this occasion. He began sending messages to President Richard Nixon that he might just tell all he knew about what really happened in Dallas on November 22, 1963. And one of Nixon's presidential aides, Dean Birch, recalls that when he heard about this, George Bush broke out all over in assholes and shit himself to death. It was this situation which led directly to what journalists now refer to as the Watergate murder, the crash of Flight 553. On December the 8th, 1972, Dorothy Wetzel Hunt, the wife of E. Howard Hunt, boarded a flight from Washington to Chicago. A CIA agent like her husband, she carried a quarter of a million dollars in her bag, which was to buy the silence of his Watergate co-conspirators. Travelling along with Dorothy was CBS news correspondent Michelle Clark, whose CIA boyfriend had been able to give her a unique journalistic insight into what Watergate was really all about. These two women boarded the aircraft with a dozen other individuals who at that time had information which E. Howard Hunt claimed was going to blow the White House out of the water. As the plane made its final approach through fog and very low cloud, the people living near the aircraft runway sensed something rather strange was going on. The normally quiet suburban street suddenly filled up with cars. And a moment later, having been told to power down too early, Flight 553 emerged from the mist and clipped the branches of some trees before crashing on top of several bungalows on West 7070 Street. The watching neighbours were then staggered to see FBI agents immediately leap out of their cars and start rooting around in the debris a full 10 minutes before the fire brigade even arrived on the scene. 44 people, including Dorothy Hunt and Michelle Clark, were killed in the crash. E. Howard Hunt served his time and came out of prison a widower and a million dollars richer. The Nazi shallow government of the United States had faced a blackmail threat and the possibility that their complicity in the murder of President Kennedy might become public knowledge. Their response was to bring down a civilian airliner onto a residential district. They covered it up by having FBI agents on the ground seek out and remove all incriminating documents from the dead bodies found in the wreckage. And when the local TV station received an anonymous phone call from a radio ham who had monitored the deliberately misleading exchanges from the Midway Control Tower, which caused 553 to crash, an FBI agent simply confiscated all the tapes, thus eradicating all information pertaining to the accident. This is how the agents of the US government now behave. They function essentially as a goon squad of mercenaries and murderers, hardly any different to Hitler's Gestapo, and are used as a private intelligence service and as personal hit men for America's richest families, their only role being to cover up the dirty tricks which the rich people are playing on their fellow countrymen every day. Along with threats and murder, the most important weapon used by this private army of footpads in this ongoing cover-up is disinformation. And it's here that we can now address a question which will probably be bothering the huge numbers of people who have taken an interest in the Kennedy assassination and in the many documentaries produced by assassination researchers over the years. What happened to Badgeman? The answer is very simple. He never existed. He was simply a phantom created by the CIA's disinformation machine to lay down a trail which led nowhere. So now another question appears. If this is so, why have so many people spent a quarter of a century trying to discover his identity? By examining this question, it is now possible to reveal the extraordinary lengths America's rulers have gone to in order to hide the truth about the Kennedy assassination. 
America's oligarchs grossly underestimated the courage and skill of those who tried to uncover the truth about the Kennedy killing, none more so than the brilliant and tenacious Mark Lane. By the mid-1960s, his film, Rush to Judgment, had left the country in no doubt that they had been multiple gunmen acting together in some sort of conspiracy. Once he had proved this beyond any doubt, the only question remaining was, how big was the conspiracy? So it came as no surprise when polls started showing that 9 out of 10 Americans believed it had to be the CIA. This internal memorandum reveals just how nervous the agency was about this development. It spells out in no uncertain terms the concern spreading in the corridors of power and the urgent need to rectify this situation through the use of assets in the media. This great image problem led America's Nazis into initiating Operation Mockingbird, an ongoing policy of using the colossal wealth they were now amassing from drugs and weapons sales to buy up as many TV and film companies, newspapers and local and national radio stations as they could lay their hands on, to the point where by the 1970s they were proudly boasting that everyone of any significance in the media is CIA. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal? We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks. This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. Virtually every well-known journalist, newspaper editor, and television presenter became a secret CIA agent, as did many entertainers and film stars. The question now was how best to use trusted public figures like Walter Cronkite. And this was how the first investigative documentaries about the Kennedy assassination came to be made. It will come as a terrific shock to those who have sought truth and solace in these many films, feature articles and TV specials to learn that every last one of them, including Oliver Stone's JFK, was actually produced by the CIA. A classic early example of this kind of disinformation was the Nova film, which featured two scientists, Brian Holstrom and Steve Isabel who found Badgeman in a tiny fragment of the famous Mary Moorman Polaroid through photographic enhancement. But when investigators took the trouble to actually measure the size of these three figures, it became obvious that they were so tiny they were too small to even be children. Using the scale provided by Abraham Zabruder over on the right, it's clear that these alleged people are so lacking in stature they wouldn't actually have been able to look over the stockade fence. The truth is that they never existed. And so the question now is, who were Holstrom and Isabel? And who, for that matter, was Gordon Arnold, the old-age pensioner who appeared in The Men Who Killed Kennedy to claim that Badgeman had kicked him and taken his camera? I could be only one in... The answer is that they were all professional actors, because this is how the devil operates. Devils mix lies with truth in order to make the lies sound more plausible. And it seems that the idea for using actors in this way might very likely have come from E. Howard Hunt himself. After Hunt's deathbed confession, in which he admitted the involvement of the CIA, his son, St. John Hunt, posted many revealing statements about what kind of character his father was. It's quite well known that E. Howard Hunt wrote spy novels and screenplays, 
And when he was discussing this, St. John Hunt maintained his father tried to live his life as if every day was another exciting scene from a movie, to the total exclusion of his own family. The way St. John Hunt put it was, he would never cut carrots or go shopping with us or anything like that. James Bond doesn't have a family. Historians are well aware that the CIA studies everything, which is impressive, and it now seems very plain that they were greatly influenced by the brilliance of the Levinson and Link Columbo series, particularly one episode, Murder, Smoke and Shadows, in which the killer, who is a ruthless young movie director, tries to confuse and mislead Columbo through his powers of creating illusion, only to have the tables turned when this is done back to him, because the whole point of that episode is that the audience never know who is and who isn't supposed to be an actor. The Men Who Killed Kennedy series was laid out in the same way. Whilst a few of the interviewees, like the Willis family, were genuine, most of the people claiming to be witnesses were simply actors, whose only job was to keep people's minds on the grassy knoll, so they would never think about the storm drains and where the shots actually originated. Oliver Stone's film was made to serve exactly the same purpose. It's also very clear that the CIA spent a lot of time studying the emotional breakdown in interviews with people like the ambulance driver, Aubrey Reich. Intelligence agents are fully aware that when an audience sees someone sobbing from grief on screen, they tend to become emotional themselves. This is how sensitive, humane people react. And when this happens, you're no longer thinking. And when you're no longer thinking critically, when you suspend skepticism for the sake of emotionalism, you can be fooled. I just, I wanted to tell you why I grieve. But why I don't despair. I'm sorry. Of course, having heard this, People will wonder how anyone could be cynical to such a degree, and it's a perfectly legitimate question, because as we shall see later, this would not be the last time that the American public were fooled by actors sobbing on national TV. And these monstrous fabrications were not confined only to television. Sock man. In 2003, a book was published called Blood, Money and Power, ostensibly written by Texas law attorney Bar McClellan. This book signalled a shift in establishment policy by claiming that Lyndon Baines Johnson, a natural suspect as the king who might have killed the king, was behind the entire plot and used his own attorney, Ed Clark, to pay off the gunman. Researchers noticed that at exactly the same time a lot of information suddenly became available about all the murder plots LBJ had been involved in with Cliff Carter and Billy Solestes. We were then treated to the sensational deathbed confession of E. Howard Hunt. And in the book itself, the serious researchers found this extraordinary paragraph. Wallace sent it on Kennedy's head and fired. The shot went almost 200 feet but was barely low and slightly to the right hitting the president in the back shoulder blade. The bullet was deflected upward ever so slightly, exiting at the tie knot. The bullet's jacket separating to hit and crack the windshield, the remaining slug hitting the curbing in front of James Tague, an onlooker standing in front of the triple underpass on Commerce Street. The slug knocked cement shards in all directions. A splinter nicked Tague on the cheek. So just exactly what is going on here? This is quite obviously a ludicrous assertion. So what is it all about? What it's all about is that the CIA actually wrote this book. They knew that the critics had been able to laugh loud and long at the single bullet theory because the FBI had had to change their story. At first, they had accepted the indisputable evidence that James Tay was scratched by a bullet as he watched from below the overpass because they initially claimed that the first shot alone had gone through the president and the governor, making seven separate wounds in two different men. The second shot was the headshot, and presumably the third struck Tag. However, 
Once the Zabruder film and dozens of eyewitnesses made it plain the first shot missed, the FBI had a problem. How could they account for the throat shot, head shot and take shot with just two remaining bullets? This utterly ridiculous paragraph was a lame attempt after 40 years to come up with an answer and the lengths the CIA went to to get people to believe it were contrived to say the least. It's first of all the simplest matter to refute this version of events by asking how the CIA could possibly know this is how it happened. The bullets splitting apart in mid-air? Are they saying they had Dealey Plaza rigged with fast motion cameras which allowed them to replay the flight of every bullet in slow motion? If so, we'd all love to see those pictures. And even more to this, Bar McClellan's interview became the linchpin in the final episode of The Men Who Killed Kennedy, which was then banned from public broadcasting after a lawsuit was allegedly brought against the History Channel by former Presidents Carter and Ford and their friends Jack Valenti, Bill Moyers and Lady Bird Johnson. Of course, this was just more disinformation. What the plotters hoped to achieve was that by getting the series banned, but making it available on the internet, the seekers after truth would be duped into thinking it must be true, precisely because it had been banned from mainstream media. It's a double bluff. It is quite possible, after all of this ludicrous skullduggery, that even the CIA themselves couldn't remember what purpose it was all supposed to serve. But the general idea was that the public was supposed to swallow the notion that Lyndon Baines Johnson was the primary culprit in this entire affair, because he's dead and can't speak for himself. It is absolute nonsense to suggest any such thing. Lyndon Baines Johnson was, like Hitler and Richard Nixon, a mere puppet of the oil men and the merchant bankers and military industrialists, something he finally admitted to. I can't uh, honestly say that I've ever been completely relieved of the fact that uh, there might have been international connections. You mean you still feel that there might, might have been? Uh, well, I have not completely discounted. The notion that he was the criminal mastermind behind the Kennedy assassination is simply another disinformation falsehood dreamed up by the CIA. He was most definitely involved in the plot and offered up his personal hitman, Mac Wallace, to be part of it. But the men who actually masterminded the plot were Alan Dulles and David Attlee Phillips, with George Bush being the most important figure in the actual execution of the plan. And even they, in the end, proved themselves to be just as crude and obvious as anyone else in the way they took care of anyone who might incriminate them. On the 22nd of February 1967, Eladio Del Valle and David Ferry were both murdered within minutes of each other when it seemed they might give information to the Jim Garrison investigation. Charles Void Harrelson and Milwaukee Phil Aldericio suffered convenient early deaths in jail and having been ordered to testify before the House Select Committee on Assassinations, both Charles Nicoletti and George de Morinschild were shot dead at the same time on the 29th of March 1977. Having been scheduled to testify before the same committee, Johnny Roselli met a similar fate. His body was found floating in an oil drum in Dumbfounding Bay, Miami, just after Malcolm Wallace was murdered in exactly the same way as Lee Bowers. On a stretch of empty American highway, his car was forced off the road, then CIA agents smashed his head into the steering wheel until he died, to make it appear like a single car accident. Not long afterwards, Sam Giancarlo was shot in the back of the head while cooking sausages, and his spy inside the Chicago police force, Richard Kane, was blasted to death with a sawn-off shotgun in Rose's Sandwich Shop on the 19th of December, 1973. Absolute proof that George H. W. Bush was the most important figure behind these grisly murders and the Kennedy assassination surfaced quite recently in a declassified FBI memo which revealed he was working for the CIA in 1963 and not from 77 onwards, as he'd always claimed. He had been a lifelong friend of George de Morinschild, 
who had actually begged him for help when he realised the CIA were trying to kill him. It was therefore rather ironic that when the police checked De and Schultz's wallet, they found an address card which gave them a direct lead straight to the guilty party had they but chosen to follow it up. It said George Poppy Bush, his CIA codename, Zapata Petroleum, Midland, Texas. It became a farewell note from the man who coordinated the crime of the century, a man whose father, Prescott Bush, had created the CIA in the first place, along with his friends some 30 years before, purely in order to take care of their own business interests. They arrogantly believed they were more intelligent than anyone. But in the end, the means that George Bush-led CIA chose to silence all the major underworld figures who might incriminate them proved to be every bit as crude and obvious as Ruby's killing of Oswald on television. The whole point of George Bush and his Central Intelligence Agency was that they were supposed to be intelligent, and yet in the end, they couldn't even fool little old ladies. And who was going to inhibit them? The gangsters that are running this country is going to inhibit somebody. All institutions of the American government are essentially a gangster syndicate. And everybody knows this. So perhaps it's time now to ask what we have learned and how best we can use this new understanding about the West's secret history to evaluate what is really going on in our world right now. To begin with, let's answer a couple of questions which have perplexed many people over the years. A great many researchers and historians have wondered why the Kennedy family themselves almost seem to be aiding and abetting the cover-up by choosing to be so quiet about the assassination itself. After the revelations of Chuck Giancana, there now seems little doubt that this is because they know a full disclosure of Joe Kennedy's dirty political dealings with the Mafia would likely leave the Kennedy name in a very tarnished state. Up until now, history has tended to give the Kennedy patriarch a distinguished and squeaky clean image which went along with his appointment as the American ambassador to Britain. Like most things about the ruling class, this image is false, because it's clear that Joe Kennedy was every bit as big a crook as his business associate, Sam Giancana. However, it also seems necessary now to revise the entire history of the Kennedy brothers. The reputation of Edward Kennedy never recovered from the Chappaquiddick incident, in which Mary Jo Kopechny lost her life when she drowned in his overturned car when he allegedly drove off this unlit bridge whilst under the influence. At the time, the public believed this was a married man misbehaving, but it's come to light recently that our old friends Frank Sturgis and E. Howard Hunt were seen in the Martha's Vineyard area just prior to the accident. Once again, it's the same dirty people pulling the same dirty tricks. The media's treatment of this affair destroyed any chance Edward Kennedy might have had of becoming president, and we do now have to wonder if this was yet another example of the CIA controlling public opinion. To the same end, it is also now clear why such venerable institutions as the BBC and other prominent European broadcasters have assisted in the cover-up. They always knew the Kennedy assassination was a can of worms, and that if the whole truth in the story were pursued vigorously, it would lead right back to the gates of Auschwitz, and the obscene profits which Europe's royalty and heads of state made from their investments in slave labour. This is a brutal truth which the West must now confront, and an equally brutal problem the United States must now face is the question of what has happened to the US military in the intervening years since it murdered its own commander-in-chief. The answer is that America's armed forces are now completely controlled by the American Mafia, the mob don't even need hitmen anymore. They use United States Marines as assassins. They are, as Sam Giancana said, one organization who keep a low profile while they control the world as a business. And in an effort to prove this is so, in 1998, Pastor Rick Strawcutter videotaped a quite remarkable interview with Kay Pollard Griggs, formerly the wife of Colonel George Griggs, who for many years was the head of NATO. He was also an alcoholic of that well-known kind who was shy and unable to communicate when they are sober, but who then cannot stop talking once they have a drink. 
During the course of a stormy marriage, punctuated by periods of domestic violence, which cost Kay Griggs many black eyes and broken bones, she learned that her husband had been turned into a brutal psychopath as a consequence of his military training, which included induction into what is known as the Pink Triangle, the Cherry Marines. Over the years, far too much has been written about Lee Harvey Oswald. But what is remarkable is that few historians were ever aware that like most Marines who worked in intelligence, he was homosexually recruited and was part of the same-sex club which included Jack Ruby, George Senator and David Ferry. Kay Griggs explains that these selection procedures came into the US military when the cream of the death's head sporting Nazi top brass joined at the American ranks at the war's end. Ever since then, the Greek and Spartan traditions which Hitler so admired, and which were integral to the German army, have found their way into American military culture and are now manifest in the way that the old skull and bones procedure for identifying and most importantly controlling rising stars is now used to select the top brass of the future. In a nutshell, boy soldiers who want to rise in the ranks can only do so by doing favours for the older men. So George Bush, I mean, all these people r rise up to the ranks, uh, the same club. No wonder, you know, I saw a little TV clip one time where a reporter was asking George Bush and others about the, uh, the Order of the Skull and Bones. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? I mean, if this really got out, that these guys are all inducted because they've got some kind of homosexual right. thing on them. Indoctrination. I mean, yeah. or induction. They yeah. have to do that. Yeah. They do that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Even In a if coffin. And, and it's even now coming into the military totally. The chiefs do that. They put them in the coffin. They do the bowling ball trick. Okay, you've got to explain this. What happens when you get in the coffin? Why do you get in a coffin? Oh, they, they get... When, when you get your eagles, that's uh -huh. a German thing. Okay. You know, it's what the German high command did, and most of them, you know, had the boyfriends and stuff, mm -hmm. the croups and, and all of that. It is a German thing that they say goes back to Greece, and it's all the male marine-looking men that they, they do it with. Uh -huh. see? So now the chiefs have to do that. What they do is they get, George said, it's like a zoo. They... They get everybody really drunk, and they sometimes call it dining in. Um, uh, shellback is another time that they do it. Not everybody does it, but the ones who do it, if they're young, they, they get right up to the top. It's a... Uh, okay, well, what actually do they do? They've got a coffin, they get anal inside Anal sex. This oh, oh, that. They, they do, they put them in the coffin, and they do things. This is how military recruits are now controlled. And the Mafia military exert a similar hold over all career politicians. At some time on the way up, they are manoeuvred into a compromising position, usually through the use of two-way mirrors in a brothel. And once the Mafia military have got something on them, the career politicians, judges, senior police officers and media moguls face a stark choice. Either take your payoff, which is usually worth millions of dollars, or go to jail for life for your misdemeanor. It is with these kinds of tactics, first used by Sam Giancana in the 1930s, that what are now known as the five mafia families of the New York metropolitan area, the Genovese, Gambino, Lucchese, Colombo and the Bonanno, control all politics in the United States and through their business arrangements with the Five Star Generals and CIA control all cocaine and heroin trafficking throughout the entire world. After the dust had settled on the Kennedy assassination, Sam Jane Carner explained to his younger brother that the mob and the CIA had taken care of JFK together because they were essentially two sides of the same coin. In the last 50 years that relationship between these two secret societies has become even closer, to the point where they are now indistinguishable. The people who live in the third world are so well aware of what is really going on 
They have come to call the CIA the cocaine importing agency. The World Wide Web now abounds with proof to back this up. And although many people were sceptical at first about Kay Griggs, in recent times her most sensational claims have been fully endorsed by the FBI chief Ted Gunderson, who gave several interviews in support. This cult was involved in distributing drugs up and down the East Coast, drugs that were being flown in from Southeast Asia in military and planes. The operation was by the certain Army personnel and also CIA. She told me that there were generals involved in the drug operation. There were police officers and at least two attorneys in the Fayetteville, North Carolina area. The path that this led me down is mind-boggling. Over the last 23, 24 years, I have developed so much information about the situation as it exists in our great country and gone public with it as much as possible, and yet I am being ignored. What is basically happening is that the United States military use Air Force bases in Europe to connect with the Third World particularly Pakistan and Afghanistan, where the poppy fields are cultivated. This is the real reason for the conflict in Afghanistan. It's to protect the record harvests of heroin, which almost ended when the Taliban took power. But they don't tell the soldiers this, and it's a truth you'll never hear on NBC or BBC. Having brought the refined cocaine and heroin into Europe and the United States, it is then passed on to the Mafia for sale at street level, sometimes by police officers in uniform. It's an arrangement which nets the generals and the Mafia chiefs billions, and the fact that someone of Ted Gunderson's credibility was completely ignored when he went public with this information underlines the fact that our entire mainstream media, as well as the entire justice system, has been bought off. So the question must now be asked, if this shadow government of the world's only super state can get away with the murder of a president and through their wealth be in total control of the United States military, media and the justice system, what else might they be getting away with? Could it possibly be that the serious researchers have been right all along? And remembering what happened to Flight 553, that 9-11 truly was one huge confidence trick? Once the dust had settled on 9-11, people immediately began to realise there was something very wrong with the 9-11 TV coverage. First along came Dylan Avery with his amazing film Loose Change. He proved conclusively that the official report was nonsense because aircraft fuel does not burn at even half the temperature required to melt steel, and that the towers defied the laws of physics by collapsing with perfect uniformity at free fall speed. Buildings in Germany which were bombed over and over again didn't collapse with perfect uniformity down to ground level. Avery also pointed out that in Kennedy's time, his chiefs of staff drafted plans to kill innocent people and commit acts of terrorism in the United States in order to whip up support for a war with Cuba. Codenamed Operation Northwoods, these plans included hijacking planes, and blowing up ships and landmark buildings in order to stimulate a helpful wave of national indignation which could be used to oust Fidel Castro. And there wasn't anything exceptional in this initiative. Northwoods was an offshoot of the notorious Operation Gladio, a sustained campaign organised by MI6 and the CIA, which perpetrated many bombing atrocities in post-war Europe which they blamed on what they said were communist terror organisations. A typical example 
was the horrific bombing of Bologna railway station in 1980. Italians will be appalled to learn this outrage was committed by the Americans and the British. But this particular atrocity, which like all others during this period was intended to keep people living in fear of a bogus enemy, so they would accept increasing state control by so-called strong leaders, illustrates only too well the fact that some 40 years prior to 9-11, the cabal of secret Nazis who killed Kennedy were making serious preparations for terrorist attacks upon their European allies and even upon their own country. In the 9-11 news footage, it is abundantly clear that the interviewees are actually paid actors, speaking lines which have been written for them. I feel like I was in a movie. This is exactly the same situation as in The Men Who Killed Kennedy. And because these are people who are being expected to perform, they tend to overdo it. I could be the only one in... South America. They killed the president. And to be honest with you, if I'd have known this, I wouldn't have given the any interview. It is perfectly clear that the 9-11 street people are trying much too hard to convince their audience. Approximately several minutes after the first plane had hit, I saw this plane come out of nowhere and just ream right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. 9-11 was in reality just another CIA special effects movie production. And it really has become the Kennedy assassination's long lost twin because witnesses who know the truth of what really happened are all being murdered. This didn't stop some people from immediately pointing out that the London tube bombings were a hoax. The alleged terrorists couldn't have ridden into London on a train which was cancelled. And seasoned researchers are now becoming quite surprised at how sloppy and obvious these alleged terrorist acts are becoming. Any detective would instantly realise the Woolwich Terror incident was a joke. We were shown pictures of a supposedly decapitated man lying prone on the street. If that were true, he should be lying in a puddle of his own blood, and the alleged attacker would be soaked in blood all over his front from arterial spray. All terrorism is fake. It is military deception practiced by the rich upon the poor in an ongoing class war. And the most important weapon at their disposal in this class war are television presenters. The BBC has actually become the Ministry of Truth from Orwell's 1984. Everyone working for the BBC today is a whore of the ruling class and a traitor to our way of life because it is very hard to believe they are all unwitting accomplices in this class war. When we remember that it was some of the BBC's own journalists who revealed that the 9-11 hijackers were all alive, it's hard to accept that their news presenter colleagues haven't figured out the totalitarian nature of what people like Jane Stanley, who reported the collapse of World Trade Center 7 20 minutes before it came down, are really up to. And yet still they go on giving us reassuring smiles while telling lies on behalf of the ruling class. Of course then people ask, oh yes, 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 but why would they do it? Why is all of this Muslim, multicultural, political correctness thing happening to us right now. It's happening because we no longer have an enemy. Tourists today can visit what used to be the Eastern Bloc and they can photograph the derelict rusting heap of scrap metal which used to be the Soviet war machine. It has gone and this has created an unprecedented political situation which the world has never seen before in which there is only one superstate, the Anglo-American Alliance. No other power on Earth today is capable of fighting a war on the grand scale. China, North Korea, Russia simply do not have the economic resources. So in order to make us believe we still have an enemy, 
and therefore have to live in fear, the rich had to provide us with a new enemy. And this is why in recent years they've encouraged unstable Islamic people to emigrate to the West. It's to provide us with a ready-made enemy. This is their master plan for this single superstate age. And it's for this reason that they perverted political correctness to make people believe that anybody who refuses to go along with this new doctrine of multiculturalism is the worst person of all. In the West today, we've become quite used to seeing confrontations between the alleged lunatic fringe of Islam and indigenous white men who are trying to defend their culture from foreign influences. What groups like the EDL do not understand, however, is who is really pulling the strings here? Who is behind this? Who arranged this fight? Because any Roman senator would tell you this is simply the old maxim of divide and rule. The Romans invented this system. They always made sure that every conquered region pushed together tribes who were traditionally hostile to one another. The British copied this method after World War I by redrawing the entire map of the Middle East to make sure that the new boundaries always set one Arab tribe against another, particularly the Kurds. What we see on the streets of Britain and America today is the same thing. The whole idea is that while you're fighting against Muslims and they're fighting against you, no one has the time to stop and think about who actually created this situation and who their real enemy really is. The rulers of the Middle Ages arranged a never-ending religious war between Catholic and Protestant for precisely the same reason. Now, why must we always think we have an enemy? Because the ruling group always maintain their position in society by controlling the population through fear. Think about it. If we don't have an enemy, would the public be prepared to pay for the army? Would we be happy to pay for MI5 so that they can read our emails and put a surveillance camera on every street corner? Big Brother has to have an excuse for watching us all, all the time. And what they call national security is always the perfect excuse. The moment you make a world at peace, it's gone. The keystone in the arch of ruling class power is gone if we don't have an enemy. So the rich are always going to provide us with an enemy forever. And the lesson we need to learn from all of this is that everything in our lives is and always has been a rich man's trick. When people think of ancient Rome, they always tend to think about the gladiators in the Roman arena. But something people don't realize is that Roman amphitheaters were a scam. They were perhaps the very first big confidence trick in human history, played by more cunning rich men upon a naive public. What Caesar did was to say to the Roman Vulgate, I will give you gladiatorial games, but only if I can have your votes. And he only offered this bargain because he knew the Vulgate loved the games more than they loved anything. This is how the Roman maxim, Panem et Circenses, bread and circuses, became established. Because Caesar was the first politician to understand that if you give people what they want, they will tolerate being ruled. By this means, Julius Caesar made himself the first dictator whose fortune was protected by a professional army. And everything that every ruler has given us since Caesar has simply been another rich man's trick. Religion is a rich man's trick. It was invented because wealthy rulers realised the population was getting too big for soldiers to watch over constantly. So they replaced the idea of having many gods with one single god. A simple idea simple men could understand. Who could see what everyone was doing all the time. The idea of one god became the surveillance video of the ancient world. In the Middle Ages, the same sort of people grew rich by charging people for the forgiving of sins. And when a new age dawned with the coming of Industrial Revolution, they invented new tricks to control the population explosion like 
censorship. Every grown-up knows that there is one law for the rich and one law for the rest, because the justice system is a rich man's trick. Mafia godfathers like Sam Giancana walked free from American criminal courts over and over again by taking the Fifth Amendment, because it is a criminal's law. And it's the same with everything else. The media is a rich man's trick. The tax system, because the rich never pay any tax, is a rich man's trick. Political correctness is a rich man's trick. The murder plot to kill Lady Diana Spencer was a rich man's trick. And the war on terror, 9-11, the London tube bombings, the Woolwich terror attack, the Kennedy assassination, all of it is simply another rich man's trick controlling how we think. Now, once again, it is very easy at this point to imagine the reaction of conservative politicians who will, of course, try to laugh this off and scoff. Everything is a rich man's trick. Are we seriously suggesting that the Cold War was a rich man's trick? Now, in your research and analysis and your efforts to bring out the facts about what was going on in our society, did you encounter any effort to discourage you, to prevent you from bringing out the background of America's involvement in the financing of international communism? Yes, very definitely. Um, for example, uh, when I was at the Hoover Institution, uh, in 1972, I went to Miami Beach to give some testimony before the um, Republican National Committee. And uh, although a congressman had hand-delivered to the wire services this testimony, which was later printed, uh, the wire services refused to transmit it to the newspapers. Then when I got back to the Hoover Institution um, in California, um, I was called into the office of the director and... Uh, I was uh, told in no uncertain terms not to make any more speeches like that and that this information should not be made public. This was the information that we were uh, giving uh, the, the Soviet Union the technology to develop its war potential? Oh, yes. At that time we were, in, we, we were in Vietnam and as you know the Soviets were supplying the North Vietnamese. This was 1972? 1972, yes. And uh, for example, I knew that the Gorky plant, which was built by the Ford Motor Company, but the Gorky plant in Russia produces the gas series of vehicles. The gas vehicles had been seen on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We were supplying equipment to the Gorky plant in the middle of the Vietnamese War, and these trucks were being used to carry ammunition supplies, which were killing Americans. Now, I thought this was morally wrong, and I said so at Miami Beach and at the Hoover Institution. And it was this type of information uh, that was suppressed. The rich would much rather we didn't think at all, and certainly not about the wise words of the columnist Claire Rayner, who once famously said that the only reason we now have to live under kings and queens and presidents is that in past ages their ancestors were the best thieves. In the Middle Ages, when the king was feeling greedy and wanted to pay for a new mistress or grand new palace, he simply sent out his robber barons to steal half the herd of every local farmer. And if they complained, the robber barons would say the king needed to feed the army, or some similar excuse. That is how it was done then. But today, the ruling class face a different problem. We now live in an industrial age, and as George Orwell explains in his novel 1984, if the machine age was directed solely with the intention of making the common people physically comfortable, in a mega-productive, computer-controlled epoch, we could soon all live like millionaires. But think what this would mean. If we're all millionaires, we all fly first class. So the king and the queen and the president have to wait in a queue with everyone else. And do you honestly believe the Queen of England would wait in a queue behind you? If we're all millionaires, we all play golf. The king and the president can't get on the course. And there's no room on their exclusive beach. Orwell himself would have said the most important single sentence in 1984 was this one. If it once became general, wealth would confer no distinction. Our lords and masters are not going to wait in queues with the rest of us. So the special problem which fat cats face today is how to keep the wheels of industry turning because, as Orwell explains, the oligarchs have to make use of the masses without significantly raising the general standard of living. 
This is a more sophisticated age, so the robber barons need a more sophisticated means of stealing most of the wealth and of keeping most of the common people in poverty. What the rich face today is a situation in which the common people spend most of their lives on a 9 to 5 treadmill. They make things in factories, they grow things and harvest them, they teach in the schools, nurse in the hospitals, and as a result of their daily labours a huge mountain of money is produced. Now the rulers have a problem. How can they keep the ordinary people hard at work so they're too exhausted at the end of every day to think about whether this is a fair system? The solution, as Sam Giancana explained, is to invent a foreign enemy, a boogeyman, who wants to conquer the whole world. This becomes a perfect excuse to make people pay for a sophisticated array of increasingly expensive weapons which are made by companies which the fat cats themselves own. And in one neat little scam, the modern robber baron has a means of stealing most of the wealth produced by Western society while leaving the common people with just enough crumbs to keep them going. Every year, America's oligarchs take $3 trillion out of the United States economy. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. $2.3 trillion, with a T. That's $8,000 for every man, woman, and child in America. This is how the rich have rigged the system, so that it benefits them at the expense of everyone else all the time. But in order to keep this fraud going, the public must always be convinced of the need for military expenditure. This is where all the phony terrorism comes in. And if we want to find out who is behind this ongoing hoax, we only have to look at Securicom, the company in charge of World Trade Center Security, who removed all guards and sniffer dogs from the buildings on September 10th, so that the charges which brought down the towers in controlled explosions could be planted. If we now ask who is the chief of Securicom, who do we find? Marvin P. Bush, brother of George W. Bush, son of the man who orchestrated the plot to assassinate President Kennedy, and grandson of the man who made the family fortune from Auschwitz slave labour. The Bush family and their rich friends have been behind all of it. During his time as President, George W. Bush connived with Tony Blair to introduce a deliberate policy of allowing unbalanced and aggressive Muslims to flood into Western countries. They did this in the hope that they would commit atrocities in their adopted countries, and they were actually delighted when the Washington DC sniper and the Fort Hood shootings made headlines because they knew such events would make it easier for the public to swallow the idea that 9-11 was simply more typical Islamic terrorism. The truth is that Islam is simply being used like a pawn on a chessboard in a game the fat cats have been playing since World War I. 70 years ago they gave us what they called their Hitler project. 50 years ago, it was the JFK Assassination Project. Today, we're having to suffer the War on Terror Project. And when this current lunacy is over, they'll have another excuse ready to create yet another phony war and yet another patsy. If George Orwell was still alive today, and he was asked to comment upon all the significant political events of the last decade, it's quite likely he would simply restate the Orwellian definition of totalitarianism. To wit, a society living by and for continuous warfare, in which the ruling caste have ceased to have any real function but succeed in claim to power through force and fraud, and then ask whether this sounds like the world we live in. Because it ought to be obvious by now that our seemingly endless economic recessions are being deliberately orchestrated. In today's world, the commodities markets are arranged in such a way that the price of virtually everything, particularly food, hardly ever changes. So how then can it be that the price of oil increased tenfold in the last decade? Economists are now tacitly agreeing that this was due to financialization, which is just a fancy way of saying rich creeps like the Bush family and their merchant banking friends used their trillionaire fortunes to rig the market. Why did they do this? Because great entrepreneurs like Stelios, with their budget air travel, had managed to break the cartel of the major airlines. Ordinary working families had begun living a jet-set lifestyle, 
the ruling elite of the entire world were simply terrified. Because a jet-set lifestyle is supposed to be the exclusive preserve of the rich. What would happen to their social status if the whole world were part of the jet-set? So, the rich arranged for the credit crunch, and now working families who used to fly ten times a year can't even afford to use their car. What George Orwell understood, better than anyone, is that every age is basically the same. It is always a story in which a small elite group of greedy people cling to unjust power and privileges by practicing an ongoing deception upon their followers. Caesar did it with bread and circuses in the Roman arena. George Bush did it with false flag terrorism on 9-11. British newspapers have told their readers that the Queen of England is only the 10th richest person in the UK with a fortune of 3 billion. But experts who have calculated her real wealth reckon that her ownership of one-sixth of all the land on planet Earth puts her true fortune nearer to 22 trillion. And they also estimate the true wealth of the Queen's merchant bankers, the Rothschilds, the people who started all of this greed by lending money to the Harrimans and the Morgans, to be at least 100 trillion. So finally, we have to ask, what is to be done about all this? For in the case of America, it is obvious that in order to honour the memory of President Kennedy, Americans are now duty-bound to finish his work by finally ending the worldwide tyranny of the CIA. The time has come for ordinary Americans to ask their strong men in uniform just exactly what and who they think they are defending. And they better not take too long about it. Having established Islam in the West in order to provide us with an enemy, the elite have recently started on the second phase of their master plan, which is to wipe out anyone who is sick or disabled. In Britain, this has been manifest in the Atos scandal, which has stopped all welfare payments to people with terminal illnesses and allowed invalids, who in some cases have no limbs, to starve to death. The extermination of anyone considered feeble-minded or infirm was exactly how the Nazi regime began. And now they've started doing it again. What most amazes me in all of this is the naivety of the good people in the truth movement who go on and on and on saying they want an independent inquiry. The Bush family and their rich friends are not going to investigate themselves. And there isn't any authority on earth above that of the ruling class, so it's never going to happen. These people have got the police and the judges and the justice system completely under their control. The Queen of England cannot be prosecuted for anything, not even genocide, in a Crown Court, because the Crown Courts are hers. She owns British justice. The only way to change our corrupt system is through revolution. Everyone has to sign up to the Revolution Now website, and then the people have to march on Washington, just as they did for CIA agent Barack Obama's inauguration. Only this time, they need to kick him and every other crooked politician out and take power genuinely for the people's sake. And once again, they better not take too long about it because the last time the rich decided to play a really big trick on the world, six million lives were extinguished. Supposing they decide to give us the world's first incidence of phony nuclear terrorism by dropping an atomic bomb on Cleveland or Birmingham or on Chicago. What then? But perhaps Chicago itself might be a good place to pause and offer a word of warning to the citizens of the United States before they start thinking about the next American Revolution. We should always remember that Al Capone was seen as a hero by the ordinary working people of his own time because he gave them what they wanted – booze, sex, gambling and drugs. And some Americans have even been candid enough to admit this. We all play numbers, we all go to the racetrack, you know what I mean? We all cheat a little bit. 
It hardly needs saying that Giancana, Marcello and Traficante would have gone out of business in no time if ordinary Americans hadn't been so fond of cocaine. And, in the post-war period, many writers have noted the way in which the United States not only manifestly tolerated organised crime, but even seemed to be enchanted by it. It's a cultural phenomenon, which has led many foreigners to wonder whether there is some sort of latent criminality in the very fabric of American society, because there does seem to be some sort of tacit agreement amongst all Americans that killing a man should always be considered an option if it looks as if he might cost you a large sum of money. I suppose we'll have to kill him. I don't suppose you have any ideas on that, Diana. Well, what would you fellas say to an assassination? I hope you don't have any hidden tape machines in this office, Frank. We're talking about a capital crime here. I'd like to hear some more opinions on that. But I don't see we have any option, Frank. Let's kill the son of a bitch. This film is likely to leave Americans with the impression that JFK was assassinated by a corrupt and brutal ruling class. Perhaps they should ask themselves if they are quite sure that he wasn't simply killed by America. So it seems that finally we are left with a very simple question. What kind of society is it which kills its own best men?